I love waking up in the dark and walking the sunrise with my dogs. I didn't intend to own two huskies in a German Shepherd mix, but they each found me, and I couldn't turn them away. We usually jog about five miles daily, often in the neighborhood, but nearly as often, I load us up into the van and drive ten minutes to the wooded metro park. I love it there. They offer some trails that allow quads and motorbikes, some cycles and skis, some just people. And last year they opened a new one that allows pets. It's a five-mile loop into the area farthest from the city. We live on the northern edge of town, but in the dark, with no leaves on the trees, you can clearly see the red glow of the CVS sign for most of the hike. These are tamed woods with asphalt paths and concrete fire pits, and rangers patrolling regularly. And the hospital behind CVS means there's emergency medical care in walking distance. I was up coughing again in the night. I had a serious case of pneumonia two months ago, and was not fully recovered when this sinus infection hit me. I'm past the fever part, so we're walking again, but not yet jogging. But after being up in the night. I didn't get up in time to go walk before I dropped my kids off at school. Then my youngest had an appointment, and then I had to run a few errands, and then we had unexpected visitors right after school, and then they stayed for dinner, and finally, I got the dogs into the van, and we made it to the park just before it got dark. I was irritated at all the little things that had kept me from my walk all day, but as we drove all the way to the back of the park, I realized we'd be walking the sunset, watching it over the lake, and the hills, and throughout the bare trees. As the park was clearing out now, as it started to get dark, we may very nearly have the place to ourselves. And might not have to pull off the path to let others pass us. An amazing number of people who are afraid of dogs hike the pet path. All those little irritations had led up to this singular moment of beauty. I would not otherwise have been able to appreciate. This was going to be a really good walk. Funny how life works out when you let it. I parked in my spot, at the furthest end of the parking lot by the bathrooms. A mile-long path looped through the woods, and by the lake, and came out by the bathrooms. I liked to run it when I came here alone, as that one was walkers or jogging only. It was a glorious walk through a Bob Ross painting. My mind cleared. And my thoughts quieted, and I simply experienced the woods, my feet on the path, my dogs panting, the nature sounds, the beauty of the sky. I absolutely loved it. About halfway now, and the city sounds had faded away, until I could only hear the birds, the frogs. And insects all singing their songs of territory, and mating, and life. When there was a crack, breaking the utter silence and absolute stillness, my dogs and I turned instantly towards the source of the sound, and froze. Behind us and to the right, the sound had come from the crest of a hill. I could see nothing, and heard only the dogs panting. I waited for the nature sounds to return, but they did not. All three of the dogs slowly raised their ruffs, 
fur standing on end around their shoulders and neck, tails held tall and proud, making themselves look larger and more threatening. I took a step towards them, and the female husky, the leader of my little pack, instantly put her ears back and her head down and pulled me to the path. All three of them left their tails and ruffs up, but the two males also put their ears back and heads down and began to pull me. So off we went. The woods were still silent. We must have startled a buck on the slope of the hill and not seen him. And after we passed, he leapt up the hill and jumped a dead tree and his hoof hit a dead branch and the branch broke, crack, and scared everyone. Why were the woods still silent, though? Maybe there was someone up there. Homeless people stay here sometimes. The bathrooms have heat, so the pipes don't freeze. This is about as far out as the path goes. It would be a good place to sleep. Maybe he's getting up a shelter and a crack broke the branch. Why were the woods still silent, though? We were about as far away from the city as we could get in these woods, and you couldn't see the CVS sign, or the glow from the streetlights, or even hear the traffic noises. We were deep. It was dark, and still, and absolutely quiet, except for the panting dogs, and four sets of footsteps on the path. I wanted to run. The dogs wanted to run. It must have been a Bigfoot breaking a log, telling me to get out. But there are no Bigfoot in city limits. I promise you that, Brain. It was a deer. The woods are still quiet because of us. I have 200 pounds of dog hair. They're all big huskies and another 200 pounds of me. Yeah, I'm a little fat, but I've got good muscle underneath. I have broad shoulders that don't fit into women's shirts, and big hands that don't fit into women's gloves, and can lift a 100 pounds over my head. We are the scariest thing in the woods. There are no bear, there are no wolves, and no Bigfoot. There are deers, there are foxes, and there might be an angry raccoon, but we are the biggest, baddest, scariest thing here. Unless there's someone with a gun, my mind says. Shut up, you're not helping, Brain. The dogs had not stopped once to sniff or mark. Heads down, ears back, tails and ruffs still held high. They just wanted to go. We'd gone almost a mile now, me craning my head the whole time, trying to see as far as I could in all directions, while letting the dogs pull me down the path. And it was still absolutely silent. Not an overflying goose, not a cricket. Nothing moved. Nothing made a sound. Except us. Here came the third and longest of the three steep hills on the trail. I had been running these to rebuild my strength and endurance, but if I ran this, I'd be blown at the top. The top where it curved around as it crested, and you couldn't see anything past the thick trees. The top where if you were deeper in the woods, you could follow a more gradual ridge up to the crest of the hill, and wait, unseen for someone to come up the path. Ambush. It was a deer. Turn around. It was just a deer. But what if it's behind us? It's an ambush. Is it a deer? Do they have a gun? And this is why I ran. The noises in my head were unbearable. Up the hill, I walk. I pay attention, and I watch the dogs. They were still on alert but did not hesitate to go up the hill. In fact, they wanted to go faster. Just walk, don't get smoked. 
Be able to run or fight if you have to. I'm scared. The woods should not be silent. The dogs should not still be on alert. It's not a cat or a bear or a wolf, and I really doubt it's a Bigfoot. It could be a person. So let's be smart. Just walk. We are not good prey. The dogs will protect me. The huskies might not alone, but the shepherd will, and they will follow his lead. Be smart. Get out. All I could think to myself. There was only another mile now until the lake and the first parking lot. Then another half mile along the lake to the second lot, where my van was. Hearing traffic noises now, but still no birds, no crickets and no frogs. The smell almost stopped me in my tracks, but the dogs kept pulling. Sour and grassy and oddly metallic. And shit? Shit and blood? And partially digested grass? I smelled the contents of a deer's stomach. Someone hunted in these woods. And the dogs were not interested in the smell. We ran. I don't remember much of that last mile. We just ran. Denza, the big female husky, finally stopped to drink some lake water as we came out by the parking lot. Then she began to sniff and pee the boys following her lead. There was a single truck parked. I relaxed quite a bit, but still felt on edge. Down the lake in the parking lot, I could see headlights. They must be parked at the turnaround at the end of the lot closest to the lake, as they illuminated the lakeside path. They were watching us. Halfway to the van now, and the car drove away. Twenty feet from the van, I heard a motor coming down the nearest path. I decided to put the dogs in the car on the driver's side instead of the passenger's side like normal. The sound of the motor came closer. The leashes caught on the armrest, and I had to untangle them before the dogs could jump into the van. The motor came closer down the path. I had to be gone before it came out. I knew it with absolute certainty. Finally, the dogs were in. I slammed the door and jumped in the front, fumbling for the lock button, shaking hands, unclipping the keys from my jogging belt and starting the car and gunning it into reverse. And as my headlights swept over the entrance of the path by the bathrooms, they lit up a four-wheeler coming out of the woods. I was dropping the transmission into drive and hitting the gas. And as my brain processed what my eyes saw, it informed me that there was something across the handlebar. A gun? A deer carcass? I couldn't tell because of the angle when pulling away. I couldn't see him in the rearview mirror. This is the most insane thing to ever happen to me. And it is 100% true. Let me give you a slight backstory. We go to the desert in Glamis, California. It's a very busy desert. Hundreds of thousands could be there at any time, especially holiday weekends such as New Year. Glamis has meetup spots. One of those is called Olds Mobile Hill. It's a gigantic sand dune that hundreds of people meet up at and race up. Some people literally race some big trucks to try and see if they'll make it up the hill and get stuck. People on quads, buggies, dirt bikes, and everything in between go up this hill and mess around on it. Well, as you can imagine, it got a little crazy. Alcohol and horsepower don't mix, so there were a lot of accidents. And the BLM decided more cops and shutting down Olds Mobile around 9pm before things got nuts for safety reasons. Side note, my dad once stumbled upon a wreck where the people were decapitated by another buggy. Like I said, it can be very dangerous. But the interesting part was that all the cops had SUVs at the time. So all you needed to do to outrun the cops was to go through the dunes. Their vehicles couldn't follow. So here we are, 
Oldsmobile shuts down at night. Cops in SUVs monitoring the area, more trying to keep it safe. Now to the actual story. I was nine years old. It was New Year's weekend out in Glamis. There are large areas to camp, and everyone just kind of crams around each other in circles. So we're at camp. It's night. Night riding can be even more dangerous, and usually, when you have young kids, you don't go out after dark. All the adults are drinking, and we had a large camp with maybe 25 people in five motorhomes. That weekend, someone brought a famous NASCAR slash Baja racer. It was pretty cool. He brought his NASCAR lookout tower gigantic semi-truck fifth wheel trailer. Anyway, the adults were all drunk at this point. My stepmom and dad got into some huge blowout fight. Who knows what about? They always fought. But all of a sudden, my dad starts taking the top off our buggy like he's going to leave. I know he's drunk. Everyone knows he's drunk. And we try and tell him to stop, but he doesn't. Let me explain about the buggy we had. It has 1,110 horsepower. So this is not some play toy. My dad jumps into the buggy despite our attempts to stop him and takes off. It's night, so my stepmom and I are a bit worried. Everyone was in the middle of camp by a fire, and all witnessed him take off, all mad the way he did. Hours go by, hours. My stepbrother had gone to bed as well as all the other kids in camp had, except for me. I'm still sitting by the fire with most of the adults. I think they all wanted to know if he'd come back safely, and we're waiting. So like I said, it'd been a long time, maybe three hours and it was quite late, maybe midnight. I'm freaking out, but quiet, as is my stepmom. Some of the people were whispering about it. When out of nowhere my dad comes flying into camp, I mean at least going 60, and slams on his brakes being all dramatic. He jumps out of the buggy and starts yelling at my stepmom to come help him put the tarp back over the buggy quickly. He's doing all of this in front of everyone, and they're all staring. We start asking him where he'd been, and he just shushes us and says basically nothing about anything. Now that the buggy is hidden under the tarp, he goes and puts on a hoodie, puts the hoodie up, and sits at the fire away from any openings in the circle of the camp. Weird. Everyone was whispering. Even I can see something is very wrong. He's acting super shifty and freaked out, and wouldn't tell anyone what happened. Do you see where I'm going with this? He left drunk in a monster of a vehicle at night. Did he hit someone? Did he hit something and dip? What could he have done? Some of the people there were assholes, and I overheard them talking about that, and then I knew how truly serious the situation might be. So... Now he's been back at camp for about 20 minutes. People are starting to go to bed. And all of a sudden, the piercing sounds come from everywhere. And nowhere. Blue and red flashing lights come flying into every single angle of our camp. Sirens blaring as ten cop cars literally pull right up to the campfire. Meanwhile, I had gone into our motorhome to get some sleep but obviously ran outside in an instant when I saw all of this happening. The cops had megaphones and were calling my dad's name, saying he needed to stand up, put his hands on his head, and walk backwards slowly. All the spotlights beaming on him. I had tried to run to him, but some guy in our camp grabbed the back of my jacket just in time and pulled me back. I started screaming for my dad. My stepmom launches herself in front of my dad's outstretched arms, screaming and asking what he did. The cops were ignoring her and just commanding my dad to walk backwards slowly to their SUVs. As if all of this wasn't enough, a helicopter starts circling our camp with a spotlight directly on the cops and my dad, circling over and over. My dad gets to the cops and gets handcuffed. I'm screaming. My stepmom is screaming, about to get herself arrested because she's drunk and going nuts. 
My dad's about to get into the cop car, when all of a sudden the cop says something over the radio, and the helicopter microphone comes on, and the pilot says, Thanks for the ride, John, and takes off. The cops start cracking up. My dad's on the ground laughing, and everyone is freaking stunned silent. Like, what? We have absolutely no idea what's going on. The cops all shake hands with my dad. We're all just standing there so confused and the cops leave. I shit you not. It was a prank. One of the most terrifying things to ever happen to me was a damn prank. We come to find out my dad had just drove around for a while to cool off, sobered up, and decided to go to Oldsmobile Hill after hours so that he could have it all to himself. He comes over the hill and there are cops everywhere, and a little flight helicopter. They stop him, and he thought for sure he was in trouble. But they ask him for a ride. They were the cops and helicopter for life flight, and were just basically waiting around for some sort of emergency. My dad took all ten cops and the pilot up Oldsmobile Hill over and over, racing up and launching over the top, scaring the hell out of all of them. When they were all done, One of the cops jokingly asks what they could do to repay him for the fun. And my crazy dad somehow got them to pull a full-scale invasion on our camp. I guess they had nothing better to do. So they did. Scared the absolute hell out of me and everyone there. It was the damn most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me. And I was completely scarred by that event for a couple of years. Waking up in the middle of the night and screaming for my dad in my dreams. Yeah. Thanks, Dad. I had a rather strange night a few years back. In 2013, roughly. Back then, I was visiting my uncle's house in a pretty low population area of northern Colorado that was founded in the early 1800s. There's a lot of dirt roads, and a super old cemetery with graves from that century as well. We would go out there with the intention of ghost hunting in the cemetery, and also finding new spots to explore, including a house, where we've encountered a spirit telling us to audibly get out, right before we saw red eyes appear, about six feet high in the doorway. Not being scared off, We continued to explore different spots, going up there almost every weekend for a few months. There were several strange events that we experienced, but definitely the strangest by far occurred one night, while driving out there with my uncle and three of my cousins. The first part of the story happened at around 2am on a dirt road, about a 15 minute drive away from any form of civilization. So we're driving down the road, and come to a bridge, where there's a pretty fast flowing river going underneath. So we decide it's a good spot to stop and check it out. Next to the bridge and river, there's a large grain field stretching way out to a small forest, maybe a half mile away into the distance. You're able to walk into the field by way of a dirt path, heading towards the forest. After walking around for a few minutes, watching the water and not really having anything happen, we're getting ready to go, and we see a small orange light appear in the middle of the grain, starting to slowly bob up and down, slowly coming towards us. Keep in mind, that we're out in the middle of nowhere, and there's no homes or any form of civilization nearby for a few miles. So we see this light, and get a little nervous, thinking maybe it's like a person out there who owned the land or something, and were coming to tell us to leave. So we get back in the car, and start to slowly drive away while watching the light. This strange thing about the light, is it was square, almost looking like a lantern, and it seemed to come out of nowhere. So as we're slowly rolling away, 
the light starts to pick up speed towards us. I'm talking about at least 10 miles an hour fast, just moving through the grain field. So we're officially spooked at this point, and we start to drive faster away. And about a quarter of a mile down the road, my uncle's van just dies. All electronics go out, and the engine shuts off, and we're just slowly rolling, surrounded by silence, still able to see the light in the field, not slowly moving. So my uncle luckily gets the van started back up, and we fly out of there. Fast forward a week, we go back up there to the exact same spot to check it out during the day, and we get to the bridge and make a startling discovery. Under the bridge, where only a week ago there was a fast river flowing, it just dried up and was a narrow pathway where you could tell a river once was. The thing is, it looked like it had been dried up for years. After being confused for a minute, we decided that there was something strange afoot about this area, and that we should come back later at night to see what happened. So we go about our day, and wait for it to get dark. At 1am, we headed back over to the spot, and the whole vibe everywhere was just super weird. So we pull up, and shut off the van, and it takes us all about a second to muster up the strength to leave the car. One of my cousins and I decided to start to walk up the dirt path that leads alongside the grain fields towards the forest, pretty close to where we saw the lights that week before. We're just walking along, kind of bullshitting, trying to talk to each other and distract ourselves to not be nervous. We're walking along, and it's pretty quiet. There's nothing happening, and as I'm starting to pull my phone out, to have it ready to record in case anything happened, we heard my uncle start yelling for us in a hurry, and to come back in a super concerned voice. So we turn around and we're maybe a little over of a quarter of a mile away from the car, and we start back, not in a hurry or anything, and maybe five seconds goes by, and there's a loud sound that goes off towards the forest. I always have trouble explaining exactly how it happened, but it was just this deep roaring sound, almost exactly like the one you'd hear in COD Black Ops Zombies when you turn on the power in the theatre, just like no normal animal or human sound I've ever heard before. Anyway. We heard the sound and take off running back at full speed towards the car. I covered that distance in less than 30 seconds, and I was back in the car with the door locked faster than I ever thought possible. After my cousin and I calmed down after a few minutes, we all get out of the car and tell my uncle and other cousin what we heard. He then told us the reason he called us to come back to the car in the first place was because he saw three lights shoot up in the sky right above our heads, and it freaked him out. After being shaken up, we decided to leave. As we're driving back home, we're all just talking about how weird the vibe was all night. And just as my uncle was saying something, we start to pass by something on the side road. And we're all like, what the hell is that? So we turned around, and pulled over to get it out. There's just a car on the side of the dirt road, just flipped on its back with the window shattered, a fresh sign of an accident. We were checking if anyone was hurt, but no one was around. Again, we were miles into the middle of nowhere, and there was nowhere for anyone to go. Whoever crashed also left their purse behind, which we thought was strange. We checked the surrounding areas, no one, was around to be found. So we called the cops and let them know about the accident and headed home. Some weird stuff happened while I was trying to sleep throughout the night. Like through the window, I could see the lights outside keep turning on and off, and I was laying in the dark by myself in the living room. I didn't sleep until the sun got up. After doing some reflection, I wasn't sure what to make of the whole situation 
and just figured it could be something like a spirit or a skinwalker or a Bigfoot or something. And it was maybe just a coincidence with the car accident, but I'm not sure. Now, I've kind of pieced together that it could be something like an alien encounter. Like the lights in the sky that my uncle saw, the weird inhuman scream, and the car could have been like an abduction site, where they bring the person back after some time and make them wake up thinking they were just in an accident. Only because it was just so sketchy how the car was perfectly intact, other than the windows being shattered, and the obvious fact that it was completely flipped over, and there was no second car or dented parts, like if a second car had flipped it over, and it was all flat land, so I couldn't make sense of the car. It couldn't have just flipped over by itself, and not be all destroyed or scratched or dented. It literally looked like someone picked it up, set it perfectly on the roof and just smashed out the windows. But that's my weird story, and I strongly feel like it had some sort of extraterrestrial encounter. This happened to my grandfather in the late 50s. He went camping with some of his buddies and his then girlfriend, my now grandmother. They were out in the middle of nowhere. Back then, there were far more undeveloped areas and it was pristine wilderness and very deep where they were going. They came across a clearing, not too far in, and decided to make their camp there. They got all their stuff and started building their camp. They were roasting food over the fire, drinking a few beers and generally having a good time. It's quiet, too quiet. All the noises in the forest had suddenly stopped. Everyone seems to have taken notice. They look around and can't see anything peculiar. It was still daylight. It was around 8pm. But there was nothing to give any indication that something was wrong. They look around for a little while, seeing if there's anything in the tree line. But after waiting around and seeing nothing, they continue chatting and try to forget about it. That night they fall asleep. The chirping and the animal sounds have come back to some degree, but not like it was before, and everyone is a little bit on edge. My grandfather and grandmother are sharing a tent, and of their friends, one of them goes to pee. They get out of the tent, walk away, and are not heard from in several hours. My grandfather wakes up in the middle of the night, also to pee. And as he's walking out, through the dim embers left in the fire, does he see a lump on the ground that wasn't there before. He darts over, and it's his friend. He's quietly sobbing to himself, on the floor. My grandpa shakes him and asks him what's wrong. He's just mumbling, incoherent babble. So he tries to take him into his tent, and gets him to sleep. The next morning everyone wakes up, and goes for breakfast. The friend is still in the tent, and when they wake him up, and try to talk to him, he reveals something horrifying. He went out to pee in the night, when he heard someone calling his name from down the forest. He went down to see who it was, thinking it was another one of the party, who'd perhaps gone in a bit further to do their business and maybe were lost, seeing them in the dim embers of the light of the fire. But the further he went down, the more he realised that this person, or this voice, was getting further away. He started shouting to them, telling them that they were getting further away and to stay put. There was no reply. As he got further in, he heard someone almost behind him whisper, Nearly there. He turned around, and there was nothing there. He ran as fast as he could, but tripped up on a vine and smashed his face to the ground. 
Although there was no cuts or bruisings, he crawled his way up the top and reached our campsite and was huddled over just recovering in the dark for a few seconds, trying to lie low to not be seen by whatever it was. That's when my grandfather found him. He says that for the rest of the night, he stayed up until he passed out, listening, hearing the voice in the woods occasionally call out his name. Roger, Roger, I'm waiting. He never went camping again. My grandfather swears this story's true, as the look on Roger's face was one of absolute terror, and there's no way that this honest, hard-working man would ever make something up like that. They didn't go camping again. This happened in August of 2008. To preface, I was 16 and stupid. I was in love with my then boyfriend, the way that Ariel was 16 and in love with Prince Eric. His parents were split up. He lived with his dad, who was really strict and kind of scary. On the weekends, he stayed with his mum. His mum lived down the street from my aunt and best friend. At night, I would sneak over and we would hang out until the early hours of the morning. Anyway, we were caught and weren't allowed to see each other. Eventually, both of our parents got over it and conceded that we could see each other at a county fair, with his dad and stepmom supervising. At the fair, my then boyfriend Gabe told me he wanted to see me that night. He told me that he was going to walk to my house in the middle of the night. My house is probably 10 miles from his. I told him no, that he was crazy. And long story short, I decided to walk halfway to meet him. It was probably midnight, a full moon, and I'm walking along the streets. I had two cars stop and ask if I wanted a ride. I was terrified a cop was going to see me and take me home to my parents. So I said, no, thank you. I'm just going right up here to both cars because I'm 16 and 125 pounds of no muscle. I met Gabe and we walked to his house, probably because my parents were actually awake at my house and his mum would be asleep. I tell him about the scary cars that stopped and asked if I needed a ride. He asks why I didn't take one of them up on their offer. No one asked him if he needed a ride. He would have taken one. It would have been faster to meet me that way. We get to his house, make out, hang out, and I eventually decide I need to leave before my parents wake up and notice I'm gone. I try to go to my aunt's, but no one's home, so I start walking. It's summer and about 5am, so it's light out, and I decide to take a different road back home. I'm walking along this long stretch of road that I've been on many times when I take the bus to school. I'm listening to my iPod and see a pretty old cell phone on the ground. I pick it up and I'm surprised because it turns on, and it works. A couple of cars have passed me, and I'm starting to get a little anxious on how long it's going to take me to get home before my parents wake up. I think about what Gabe said, about how if someone had offered him a ride, he would have taken it. I decided that if someone stops and offers me a ride, I will take it. I really didn't want to be caught and grounded again, I'm not actively trying to hitchhike, putting my thumb out for a ride though. I'm carrying the phone and wondered if it had service, when an old beat up car slows down next to me. I turn my head slightly as I'm walking and an older man starts talking to me. Do you want a ride? He asks. I finally stop and take a closer look. He looks unkept hair starting to fall out, is unshaven and a bit on the heavy side. 
my stranger danger sense is tingling. But I told myself I need to stop being such a wuss. I needed to get home, and I'll just tell creepy car dude to drop me off at the casino. That is only about three miles away. I think that I'll at least shave some time off my trek. I get in the creepy guy's car, and he starts driving. He asks me what my name is, how old I am. I give him my very common middle name, and tell him I'm 18. I remember debating telling him my real age, thinking maybe it would make him think twice about doing anything funny with a minor. All of a sudden, creepy care dude puts his hands on my knee and tells me how beautiful I am. I'm frozen. I don't know how I'm supposed to react. I'm uncomfortable and alarms are going off in my head. Thank you, I say. He starts to move his hand a little more, and we pass the casino. I tell him that the casino is fine, really, and that he doesn't have to keep driving me. He tells me he's going to a specific road closer to my actual destination, and he doesn't mind helping me out. I think of anything to distract this guy, and to get his nasty hand off me. I pull out the cell phone I found earlier, and start talking animatedly. Look what I found when I was walking. I found it right before you pulled over. It still looks like it even works. I wonder who it belonged to. I'm saying anything to keep myself from panicking and giving away the fact that I'm scared. It works. The creepy dude's eyes got bigger. It looks like he struck gold. He takes his hand off me to grab the phone. Oh, I'll hold on to that for you. I'll make sure it gets back to the owner. I nod enthusiastically, agree that's what's best, and he keeps the cell phone in his hand, checking it out. He drives past his initial road, saying he can take me even closer to my place. I thank him profusely, and act more bubbly, and start talking about random nonsense. In reality, I'm still afraid of him knowing which road I live on. He finally gets to my driveway, which is about 200 feet or a little longer, with several different driveways that you can pull into. You can't see my house from the end of it though. He pulls over on the road and says, I'll just drop you off here. I think it's probably best that your parents don't see me dropping you off. Wouldn't want them to think anything. He winks. I smile and nod and thank him. He mentions something about seeing each other around, still smiling and nodding. I start walking up to my driveway, and I wait until he drives off to run up to my house. I'm amazed and so, so grateful that nothing happened to me. I really don't know what would have happened if I didn't find that cell phone to distract him with because I don't want to find out. I don't make stupid decisions like that anymore. I think I used all my lifetime luck to get out of that seemingly unharmed, and I hope to not meet again. This happened while I was in Boy Scouts in Utah. The first thing happened when I was eight to 10 years old. We were backpacking in one of the surrounding mountains of Salt Lake Valley. I can't remember which one. We'd finally reached our campsite after a few hours of hiking with heavy backpacks around dusk. Lit our camp stoves, ate dinner, and then set up tents for bed. Since it was a clear cloudless summer night, my friend and I decided to leave the rain fly off and stargaze before sleeping. Our campsite was an open area, so we had a hell of a view of the Milky Way and thousands of stars. It was beautiful. The tent was kind of cramped. It was a two person tent, but really only one person could comfortably sleep in it. But we didn't care. It was one night. About an hour or two after, we started chatting and stargazing. 
We even saw the ISS pass slowly over us. One star was flashing, different colours. We thought nothing of it at first since planets tend to do that, but then it started zipping around randomly, from one end of the sky to the other, without pattern, all the while still flashing different colours. At first I thought I was seeing things, but my friend was seeing it too. It kind of freaked us out, but we just watched it. It kept zipping around the sky at insane speeds, occasionally stopping for a few seconds, then continued zipping around. At first, we thought maybe someone else was pulling a prank, but everyone else was asleep. We heard no laughter and no laser pointer could change colour like that, so we kept watching it, never actually feeling afraid. And then, after what seemed like hours, it was just gone. We lay there for about an hour watching to see if it would return. It never did. The next morning we packed up, hiked back to our cars and left. Not sure if this next part is related, as we could have just been dehydrated. But it was pretty silent the whole ride home, and when we stopped for lunch on the way, someone said they didn't feel good. Like, throw up bad. At the time I thought nothing of it, other than stay away from me, I don't want to be sick too. He was fine the following Monday at the meeting, so obviously nothing too bad. But now, all these years later, I have to wonder, whatever that star slash planet or even UFO was, did it make him sick? Or was it just dehydration? This is another thing that happened to me. It was during my very last camp out when I was about to turn 18. It was at City of Rocks on the Idaho side. On the way there, we stopped at the skeleton of a house to wait for the rest of the cars. It was bare framework, half collapsed, and absolutely littered with debris. Even a large dugout rectangular hole, probably for the basement. Being the stupid teenagers we were, we decided to explore a little. The leaders telling us to be careful and to watch out for nails and potentially snakes. No one was hurt, even the couple of boys who decided to jump down into the basement area. Nothing of interest was found, so we got back into the cars and drove the rest of the way. Not sure if it's related, but something I've decided to add since it was at least interesting. The rest of the weekend went as usual. Even the one kid who always gets hurt manages to have to be taken to the hospital. We're forbidden to climb the rocks after that. So to protest, we broke the no electronics rule. The leaders didn't get upset at this and agreed that it was fair. Another friend and I, the one I'm very close with, had a Slenderman game on his tablet, which was still popular at the time. This is kind of important later. It was after midnight, we're all in our tents, and our electronics have exhausted their batteries. We lay down looking out the window at the very small mountain we all climbed all weekend. It's big enough to take a good 10 minutes to free climb, but small enough to see from the very top of our window about 20 yards away from base. So, more of a huge mountain shaped rock. Anyway, it was about that time when we saw several shadowy figures that looked to be crouching low on the top of the mountain. Each time we tried to focus on one, it would vanish. This freaked us out a little. There were three of us in the tent, and we all saw them. We chalked it up to our mind playing tricks on us since we were exhausted, and we've been taking turns trying to beat the Slenderman game. But we said it was best to ignore them and go to sleep. We were probably just out of our minds, trying to make us think there was something there. But who knows? I've seen some scary stuff in my life, and even my father has some scary stories from his childhood growing up in the southern Idaho desert. I guess I'll never know for sure. One of the scariest things that has ever happened to me was when I was hiking slash climbing a mountain in the Adriandax that I was unfamiliar with. My two friends were in much better shape at the time, 
and we ended up separated. They had been moving faster than I was, and went on ahead. However, I came to a fork in the trail, and had to guess which way to go. So I went left. Another mile or two later, another fork. That time, I went right. Miles kept going by, and the realization that I'm completely alone in a forest that I know very little about had hit me. I hadn't seen the map, and was planning on relying on my friends. I'm thinking in my mind, maybe I should have gone right at the first fork, or maybe I should have gone right at the second fork. Where could they have been? I kept walking, listening for other hikers, road noises, anything really. I hear nothing but the sound of the forest. My water pack runs out. Dehydration begins to set in. My leg muscles started cramping along with my shoulders, and within about an hour my head is pounding. My hands are shaky, and I start to worry more. I keep walking, one foot in front of the other for hours. The sun is beginning to set. I don't know if I'm heading towards a road or civilization, or if I'm heading deeper into the forest. I keep going. My legs are so heavy. My head hurts so much. I'm so thirsty. Anxiety level is too high to think clearly. When I stop to rest, I only feel more tired, and it's harder to get my legs back started again. I stop to pee. And it's the darkest pee I've ever seen in my life. Just as the sun is about to set, I walk down onto a fire road. At first I'm excited, but then I realize I don't know if I should turn left or right. One way might take me further away from where I want to be. I turn right and start walking. The sun is setting and the forest is so dense it turns quickly dark. I keep walking. I have thoughts of thinking that I should give up. And I think, what does giving up look like? Will I just lay down on this fire road and go to sleep? Or lay down and die? Just having a conversation with myself as I go, I see a creek on the other side of the road. I stop and feel compelled to drink from it. It's moving water, slowly moving water, and I'm afraid that it might make me sick. Is it worth the risk? What if it makes me vomit, and I end up in even worse shape? I keep walking, moving slowly, so slowly. My feet are hurting, thighs are chafed raw, and sting so badly. My running shoes have worn through the skin on the back of my Achilles tendon. Blood has been seeping through my socks and into my shoes. I hear a noise. I walk a little faster until I see a bed and breakfast. I walk right up to their front doors as if I owned the place and plan to use their restroom and guzzle water for the sink. Perfect plan. Excuse me. Could you take a picture of us? A very attractive woman approaches me with an expensive looking DSLR camera in her outstretched hand. I don't answer, but found the camera already in my hand as she was five steps away walking to her husband and two children who were already posing in front of me. I'm so confused. I snap away smile awkwardly and she takes the camera out of my hand and says thank you, with a huge smile on her face. I wander inside and walk into the bathroom. I look in the mirror, and I've never looked so bad in my life. Pale and pasty skin. My lips were far too bright to be normal. Dirt on my face. All clothes soaked through with sweat. I lean my face into the sink and drink water until I could not drink any more. I sat down on the front steps of this grand B&B and waited. 
I was glad I made it, but didn't know where I was and did not have my cell phone. Not that there was service there anyway. But about an hour later, there come my two friends walking down the same dirt road. We met up, walked to their car, and stopped at a diner to eat. I drank nearly a dozen glasses of water. I grew up in Alaska, just on the bubble of civilization. There, even in the big cities, you'll get bear and moose and such. I was walking home from the bus stop. Our driveway was about a half mile long through woods. I heard noises to my right and stopped, hoping it was anything but the one animal that scares me. And then it stepped out of the trees. I froze. My blood felt cold and stopped in my veins. It was a moose, female, fully grown, standing maybe 20 feet from me in the middle of the road. It stopped and turned to look at me. I was scared with no backup plan. What can a 12 year old do up against a fully grown moose? Then it happened. I heard another noise. I thought I was truly dead. This time, it was behind me. I thought now my life was over. I'm between a mama and baby moose, and I am going to die. I remember feeling frozen, and not at all tranquil and at peace. I couldn't even scream. From the edge of my eyesight, I saw the second moose emerging from the thick strand of all the trees and disappear behind me. I could hear the steps on the soft dirt. My eyes locked onto the moose in front of me, trying to will it to stay calm. I stopped breathing. Then I felt it. A gentle whoosh of warm air down the back of my neck, followed by the unmistakable sound of a force inhale. The moose behind me was sniffing my head. I could feel the breath, hear the nostrils flare. Some neighbor had dogs off in the woods away, and they must have gotten out of their yard and started barking inside the trees. That startled both moose that turned and ran back the way they came, crashing into the small trees and leaving. To this day, the only animal I'm afraid of is moose. I've been fishing with brown bears, had black bears say hi as they walk by my camp. Mountain lions stalk us and then leave. It doesn't rattle me until I see a cow moose alone. And then I just hope to whatever is higher than me that I am not between her and her cub. When I was a teenager, I lived in a small town located about 30 miles south of Atlanta, Georgia. I did not get my driving license or my first car until I was almost 20 years old. So between the ages of 16 to 19, I hitched frequently. This was in the early 70s when people still hitchhiked, and many drivers were still willing to pick people up, in spite of the dangers and risks posed to both drivers and riders. For the most part, I never had any trouble with people who offered me rides, but occasionally, I would get picked up by someone who would totally creep me out. This is a story about one creepy ride I accepted and how 25 years later, I would discover to my great shock that I may have been luckier than I ever had imagined. This incident occurred sometime in the summer of 74, when I was 17 years old. At that time, I was a six foot tall, 175 pound, blonde haired and blue eyed guy who did not have any trouble connecting with girls for dates. 
In fact, my story begins with me standing on the side of a highway with my thumb out, as I was trying to get back home after spending the weekend with my girlfriend, who lived in downtown Atlanta. I was traveling south, away from the city, and out of the country, where I lived with my parents. I recall that I had only had my thumb out for about 15 minutes, when a man in a big white Lincoln town car pulled over. A very large and expensive car at the time, mind you. As I walked up to the car, I scanned the inside and looked at the driver, trying to size the situation up, as I always did, just to be safe. What I saw was a tidy car, with a man in the driver's seat who looked to be in his late 30s or mid 40s, dressed in an expensive suit and tie. He had short black hair, wore black rimmed eyeglasses, and appeared to be rather on the thin side, with a gaunt face and dark eyes. I never learnt his name, but for the sake of the story we will call him Town Car Man. When I got up into the passenger side of the car, I leaned down towards the open window, and told him where I was heading, and asked if he was going that far. To which he replied that he was, in a soft voice. I was not at all wary of him, as by all appearances he was just an ordinary middle class businessman. And I opened the door, and got into the front seat next to him, without any hesitation. Generally, when I accept rides from strangers while hitchhiking, I liked to try to engage them in chat, as a sort of way to pay them for the ride by providing good conversation, and also to put them at ease about picking me up by showing them that I was harmless and not a creep, even though I felt that I did not look at all dangerous. Only if you could call having long hair and dressing in the hippie fashion at the time dangerous. However, when I began trying to chat with Town Car Man in my normal fashion, with typical small talk, I instantly started getting bad vibes from him, as I could tell that he was mostly ignoring what I was saying, and instead, kept trying to steer the conversation towards asking me personal questions about myself, such as how old I was, where I went to school, if I had a girlfriend. I tried to answer his questions politely as possible, without really giving away too much information. But Town Car Man kept on getting more and more personal, asking questions that hinted at whether or not I was sexually active with my girlfriend, telling me that when he was my age, he went around horny about half of the time, and had always been on the lookout for adventures, if you know what I mean. As the ride progressed, and we were getting further and further out of the country, I began to get very uneasy, and I started to sense that something was not quite right with him. We had left the populated city behind, and were now travelling down an old two-lane highway through the countryside that was sparsely populated. There seemed to be hardly any other cars on the road. The more that town car man continued to ask me questions about myself, wanting to know very personal things about me, like if I'd ever had an intimate relationship with my girlfriend, all the while glancing over at me from time to time with this sort of creepy, knowing look in his eye, as if he was privately enjoying some dirty secret that only he knew about. And I became ever more so uncomfortable. I don't know how better to describe it, and it really began to make me feel uneasy, as his manner seemed very cagey, and I totally sensed that there was some underlying motive in his questioning. It really put me on guard. I began to think about what I should do next, as in, should I ask him to pull over and let me out, even though I was only about half the way to my destination? 
than to be let out in the middle of nowhere. For the first time, I began to realize just how vulnerable I felt. But what made me start to feel uneasy was when he started asking me if I wanted a drink of liquor, indicating that he had several bottles with him in the trunk, and that if I wanted some, he would pull over to the side of the road and mix me up a stiff drink. Because I was growing more and more uncomfortable, I declined his offer, saying that I did not drink, which was a lie. Even at that age, I was already regularly drinking with friends. But he would not take no for an answer, and kept insisting that I really should just have one drink, because he was such a great drink mixer, and it would only take him a minute for him to fix me a very special one. After I had declined this offer for the fourth time, he abruptly changed tactics again, and began telling me a story about how when he was my age, and a young guy in the army, and how he used to hitchhike a lot too, and that he would sometimes get picked up by men who wanted to pay him money to sleep with them, and asked if anything like that had ever happened to me. By this time, I had had quite enough of all of this, and I looked him straight in the eye and said, no, that's never happened to me, and nobody had better ever offer that to me. Well, the knowing look vanished instantly from his face, and I could tell he was totally irked by how I had just reacted to his story. That exchange between us totally changed the dynamic inside the car, and he became very quiet. After a few minutes of this uneasy silence, he spoke up and told me that he wasn't turning at the next intersection, and that I needed to get out there, even though he had told me when he first picked me up that he was going my entire way. At this point, I was very relieved, and now only wanted to get out of the car. When the car came to a stop, I had just barely gotten out the car and pushed the door closed when he stepped on the gas and zoomed off literally jerking the handle of the car out of my hand. I remember that I stood there watching him drive away, until he disappeared down the road, and that my heart was beating very fast. I was both scared and angry at what had just happened. After I had calmed down, I resumed hitchhiking until I got another ride that took me home without further incident. Fast forward 25 years. It was 1999, and I had all but forgotten about my creepy ride with town car man. I'm on the internet reading through a true crime website, when I stumbled onto a story about an ultra creepy guy named Robert Bennett, a man who had been arrested after a series of vicious attacks on men who he'd picked up in his car, drugged, handcuffed them, and set their genitals on fire with a flammable liquid. The attacks took place over a 20 year period, starting around 1968 in the Atlanta area, and ending with his arrest in 1991. Prior to Bennett's arrest, this attacker became known as the Handcuff Man, and talk within the local gay community was that he was targeting men who he thought were gay prostitutes. When I saw the photo of Bennett that accompanied the article, my jaw literally dropped open, as the memories of my ride that day in 1974 came flooding back. I was certain I was looking at a picture of Town Car Man, and I was absolutely floored. I do not have any way to prove that creepy guy who picked me up was in fact this Robert Bennett, but the physical resemblance between what I remember about Town Car Man and the photo of Bennett is absolutely uncanny, and the persistent offer by Town Car Man to mix me a special drink, and his questions about whether or not I'd ever had sex with men for money, also seem to indicate that possibility. I should point out, that even though this story took place in the early 70s, in the deep south of Georgia, I was actually okay with gay people at the time, 
and even knew a few people back then who were gay. So I didn't have a problem with homosexuality at all, and still don't. But being heterosexual, I had zero interest in doing that with other men. And even if I had been into that stuff at the time, I always found it highly distasteful when people assumed that they could act in such an unwanted cagey fashion regarding sexual matters with complete strangers. I always have, and always will, find that to be extremely creepy. I live in a 16 foot camper. Before the rest of my family moved here, this was my research vehicle. I researched the history of human habitation in Colorado. So this camper has been everywhere. I've been to the harsh southeastern canyon lands, stepped out the door in the morning to find a herd of wild horses in the northwest and endured severe storms on the short grass prairie. For a while, I took it to the US-Mexico border and lived on the grounds of a museum and battle site in the Chihuahua Desert. I'd been there for quite a bit, and at 2am I heard and felt an impact on my roof, just over my bed, and claws, big claws. I've seen Jeepers Creepers, I know how this works. Anyway, I just laid there, terrified listening to something very big, attempt to peel my camper like a tin can. About an hour later, it went away. In the morning, I did snake patrol. Just before winter, a lot of rattlesnakes, lizards and such try to move into the museum. And when I looked at my camper, I saw blood on the roof and scratches. The small critters of the desert took care of a lot of whatever it was. So I didn't have much to wash off by the time I finished snake patrol. One thing I love and miss about the Chihuahua is its simplicity and efficiency. Everything has a role. Humans are just animals with fancy dens. Even if I am to be eaten by a chupacabra, it doesn't seem bizarre, because I'm living in a place where the bizarre is normal. So I went to bed that night, and the next, without much worrying about my imminent demise. A couple of nights later, it happened again. 2am. Thunk. Claws. Scrabbling. Jesus. This thing spans the entire width of my camper. Claws scrabbling. Me, terrified. The thing goes away an hour later, and there's blood on my camper roof. The next night, thunk. Claws. My camper roof being pummeled. Weird sounds. And then, thunk. On the other end of my roof, and the sound of claws coming closer to the roof over my bed. I ran out of the door, frantically unlocking my truck. From the safety of my truck, I looked back at my camper. The male owl looked on from my roof, as a female owl devoured his furry, very dead offering. He lived in the water tower. She lived across the border near a feedlot. My camper roof was the only patch of white within plain view of her community. He'd been demonstrating his abilities to hunt and kill for a week, bringing half-dead prey to the roof, letting it escape over and over, and pinning it down over and over. Finally, on this night, he wooed her. It was so sweet, I never minded cleaning up the blood after that. It only lasted another week, and then I saw them together at the water tower. This happened around three years ago, when I was away from school on a trip. The trip was for younger students. A few people from my year in school had been asked to go to help look after the younger children. 
To give perspectives, I was 14 when this happened. I was about 5 foot 2, female, and probably weighed less than 100 pounds. One particular day, the children were doing an orienteering activity in the woods, basically using a compass to follow a trail to find your way to the end of it. It was the third day into the trip, and by this time a group of four boys, who I now know all have severe behavioural problems, had taken a liking to me for whatever reason. Therefore, when the children got asked who they wanted their chaperone of the group to be, they chose me. We started the activity, and for the first 10 minutes the group of boys seemed to be doing what they were supposed to do, and I could see other groups from my school in front and behind us. So I thought everything was going fine. The woods that we were doing this activity in were huge. I had no experience with using a compass, and neither did the boys in the group. The boys I was looking after quickly became disinterested with the activity, and started to run in random directions, climb trees, etc. After around 40 minutes of chasing these boys in random directions through the woods that I'd never been in before, I realised we were completely lost and expected to be at the finish line soon. I began to panic. I was only 14 and had been put in charge of younger children, therefore I knew I would be held responsible for getting them lost. I ended up being able to scare the boys enough, telling them the teachers would go crazy if we weren't back soon, to make them focus and help me find a proper path, as by now, we were walking through bushes and trees, and completely off any type of path. This is where it gets creepy. After walking down this path for 10 minutes, I see a clearing in the trees up ahead. I couldn't see what was in this clearing, so hoping it was an exit from the woods, I started jogging up to it, followed by the boys. As I turned the corner and got a better look at the clearing, I stopped dead in my tracks. It's hard to explain how I felt when I first saw this man. All I can say is that I have never felt in so much danger before in my life. My whole body was completely glued to the spot, and I could feel the colour drain from my face. In the clearing, there was a man sat on a bench. He looked to be around his mid to late forties, slightly overweight, and looked homeless. He was balding, however the hair he had left looked damp, like it was greasy. His eyes looked glazed over, and his mouth sort of hung open. That's when I realised on closer inspection, he had red stains all around his mouth. It's hard to describe this man, but the vibes I got were pure evil. Think Fat Trevor from GTA 5. At this point, my fight or flight instinct kicked in. I spun round to see the boys behind me, who I had completely blocked out. They all looked absolutely terrified, as they had been stood behind me looking at this man too. I shouted run to the boys, and sprinted past them as fast as I could. I can honestly say I've never run so fast in my life. I could hear all the boys running behind me, and they were literally screaming bloody murder. I didn't even look back for a second, to be completely honest. I was only thinking about myself in this moment, and getting the hell out of there fast. I knew the man was chasing behind us, because the boys were screaming, and he's coming behind us. I don't know how the boys were shouting so much, all I could think of was my imminent death. Fortunately, my creeper was overweight and couldn't keep up with five teenagers who just got the biggest adrenaline rush of their lives. I'll never know what would have happened if we didn't run, or if the man caught up with us, and I can honestly say I'm glad. We came across two elderly women walking their dogs about a half hour after the incident, 
and managed to hitchhike a lift back to the camping grounds. I knew it was stupid, but it was either sweet old ladies offering help, or stay in the woods with fat cannibal Trevor. So creepy guy in the woods, let's not meet again. This is an encounter I had about eight months ago. I was out for a drive this evening through some back roads outside my small urban town around 10.30 to 11 p.m. I've driven these roads dozens of times before and I've never had an issue until tonight. Just a preface, there are little to no houses along these specific roads and there's never traffic so it's very isolated. I'm cruising around the twisty roads, enjoying myself and kind of in my zone, when I come over the crest of a right turn that goes up a hill, which then sweeps down into a flat left turn, which has a guardrail along the right side of the road. As I crest the hill, as I was going fairly slow, 40 to 50, as there are often deer or possums in the area, I notice a moving figure along the guardrail. I begin to slow some more, as I figure it's a deer and don't want to hit it. But as I get closer, I realize it's not a deer. It looks like a man. At this point, I'm barely moving, just creeping forwards to get closer to it and I realize it's a man who's crouched down in a sort of slav squat, and he's now turned around to look at me. In my headlights, the first things I notice are, he's not wearing any clothes, save for a pair of tidy whities or an adult diaper. His eyes are oddly large for an adult man and completely brown or black, and his skin, was ghostly white. As I approached, I turned my brights on and he didn't even flinch. By now, I've completely stopped and started to reach down to get my phone as I wanted to take a video. This was a huge mistake. I look away for a split second to grab my phone from the passenger seat. And as I'm starting to look down, he starts sprinting at me. He is running directly towards me. Shit. He gets up to my window and starts screaming. Not just like a man yelling, but like all the rage he's ever felt is coming out at this moment. And it's directed at me. He starts pounding on the window with his fists, all the while screaming his head off. This lasts for about three seconds before I throw it into first gear and peer out, though it felt like a whole minute. As I'm accelerating, first gear in my car takes me to roughly about 40. I look in my rearview mirror and realize he's keeping up with me. It's not until I get it into second, then third, and take it up to 80 that I can see him no longer. He was running at inhuman speeds, trying to keep up. I flew the rest of the way home, afraid to stop or look into my mirrors. I got in the driveway, ran inside, and typed this up. I have no idea what I encountered, but I did, and I hated every second of it. I'd be finding other routes to take, when I take nighttime drives in future, just so that I don't ever meet him again. I went camping with a group of friends on some public land that I knew quite well. I spent a lot of time out there trail riding and camping most weekends for about three years. We set up camp at a spot we had used a few times and had partied with other people at this spot on a number of occasions. On this trip, there were six of us, and four of my friends decided to go to a party, 
that we found out about while on the trails earlier that day. I was tired from digging my Jeep out of a sand washout that I had no business driving into, but it looked pretty cool for about two minutes until I got stuck. Anyway, my friend's girlfriend decided to stay at camp with me when everyone else left for the party. We watched the fire die down and listened to the animals. I got a kick out of her being afraid of the coyotes making noise on the other side of the swamp. I assured her it was fine and they wouldn't bother us. After a bit, we get into our sleeping bags. As I'm starting to doze off, she asks if I heard that. I ignore her and try to fall asleep. A minute or two later, she sits up and asks again. I respond, nope, go to sleep. Then, not even a minute later, I hear what sounds like an ice cream truck on the trail we're on. This trail is one way in and out, about three miles long, and ends in a clearing. And we were camped within a quarter of a mile of the entrance slash exit. We also went to the end of the trail after we ate dinner and there wasn't anyone on it then. No one drove past either. I did not hear any engine noise, only the creepy ass music. Not to mention the trail was a rutty mess. So even a vehicle with a reasonably quiet exhaust would be revving high enough to be heard through the woods. I didn't tell her this because I didn't want to scare her more, but it scared the crap out of me. So when she asked if I had heard it that time, we got into the Jeep and went to the party. And I slept on a raggedy couch next to the bonfire in a sand pit. There's a spot in the Pines Barren in South Jersey with a monument to Emilio Carranza, known as the Mexican Lindbergh. He was an exceptional pilot and lost his life when he encountered an electrical storm and his plane crashed into the Barrens. If you're not familiar with the Pine Barrens, it's literally one million acres of nothing but pine trees, little lakes and trails, and the home of the Jersey Devil, of course. The story goes that if you're out near the Carranza Monument on the anniversary of the crash, you can hear his plane struggling vainly to stay in the air, or if it's after dark, see the lights of his plane. So one year we had nothing better to do and decided to see if it were true. We head out to the monument, which is about 10 miles from the nearest road, and sit around and wait. After a while, we start to hear the sound of a propeller plane, which, no big deal, there are plenty of small airports around, so that isn't exactly creepy. It starts to get weird though. When it became clear that the noise wasn't getting any closer or further away, it was just a constant drone, as if you were standing near a plane idle on the runway, and it didn't stop. We were out there for an hour or so just listening, it was crazy. When I was younger, probably between 10 and 11, I went camping with my family. I'll just get right to it. It was about one or two in the morning and I couldn't really sleep. The tent me and my brother were in was really hot and very uncomfortable. Anyway, while I was trying to go to bed, I heard a very faint whimper. I tried to ignore it, because I figured I was just tired. Our campsite was along a road with many other camps nearby. The whimpers started to get louder, and then turned into crying. I heard footsteps outside of our tent, and a girl crying her eyes out. Now let me tell you, it didn't go faint, it got louder and louder. It remained in the same spot the entire time. That's so important, because it indicates that she was looking at our tent site, crying. 
It then gets worse. Then it turned into a full-on scream for a few seconds, then cuts out. When she started screaming, my brother woke up. We both look at each other and just get all the pillows and stuff our heads under them. We couldn't sleep at all that night. I'm glad we left next morning. I worked in the Idaho backcountry for a summer doing vegetation work and weed spraying. My coworker and I shared a wall tent 20 miles away from any human and 60 miles from any town along a beautiful creek. We wouldn't see a soul for 10 or more days at a time. Part of our job was reading the journals of those who worked before us to get an idea past herbicide applications, whether weeds were last year and what kind. I often referred to the journal of one of the workers from the year prior, Andrew. According to his journal, he had to work a few days along because his co-worker Amy got sick and decided to pack out with some horsemen a few days before the hitch was over. The first day Andrew was alone, he saw a guy hiking who looked kind of ragged and dazed. His notes say that he looked super skinny and was maybe in his 60s. He says his name was Ray and that he was with a group, but Andrew hadn't seen anyone else and Ray didn't have a backpack, but Andrew knew that there was a hunting camp 10 miles away that sometimes had visitors. So they parted ways. The first night alone went well. Andrew enjoyed having time to himself and took a creek bath and read his book. He had a productive next day, working and decided to do a cool hike nearby that Amy wouldn't have done with him, but it took longer than expected. When Andrew got back to camp, it was dusk, and he saw the shadows from a fire flickering on the wall tent. He was confused. Had Amy come back? As he got closer, he saw that Ray was sitting there and had started a fire. Andrew asked what was going on, but Ray wouldn't speak and just kept staring at the flames. Andrew got out his radio and called the forest service but it was too late on the evening for anyone to be on. He offered Ray some food, but he refused. It gets pretty cold there at night, so Andrew showed him to Amy's cot since she was gone, and they both fell asleep pretty quickly after that. According to Andrew's journal, he woke up in the middle of the night to Ray's screaming. He was naked on the cot, apparently having a night terror. He wouldn't wake up and was hysterical. He looked like a ghost. Andrew sat outside the rest of the night and dozed off. When he woke up, Ray was gone. He got a hold of the forest service and started walking around camp, keeping an eye out. Several hours later, a helicopter landed in the valley and a bunch of police and dogs jumped out. Apparently, Ray had escaped the Idaho State Prison and had wandered into the wilderness for a week, looking to get to Montana. I later learned that it was common for escaped prisoners to try to hike up the drainage where we worked to get out of Idaho. And as you might expect, many of those prisoners were violent offenders with mental disabilities. And of course, Andrew had just written this nonchalantly in his journal for me to read, at night, in that very same wall tent a year later. Definitely was on alert for a few days after that. I live in Utah. I went hiking up the Bonville shoreline trail that used to be the shore of Lake Bonville ages ago. This day, I picked a different trail to follow, one I had never been on before. After hiking for a few miles up this trail, I came around a bend and I see true trees that had apparently been uprooted or fallen, and they were placed over the trail in a way that made it look like an archway. 
That by itself wasn't weird, but there were two big elk skulls placed on the end of each tree, placed just so that the empty eye sockets of the skull were looking directly at you as you passed under the trail. I thought that was kind of weird, but you know, whatever. Probably just some people thinking they're funny. I shrugged it off and kept going. But as soon as I passed through the threshold of the archway, a cold chill shot up my spine, and I felt my hackles rise instantly, and goosebumps all over my body. I kept going for a little while, because I didn't want to go back yet. But the whole time I was walking, I couldn't shake the sensation that I was being watched. It had me feeling really tense. I walked for a good 10 minutes before I decided to turn around. As I'm walking back, maybe five minutes later, it gets real quiet very suddenly. All of the birds stopped chirping. All of the little animals around stopped moving. It even seemed like the wind died down at that moment too. Total silence. My dad was a real big hunter when I was younger, so I'm very familiar with the idea that sudden quiet in the wilderness is generally bad news. By this point, I had a white knuckle grip on the hilt of my big survival knife as I kept walking down the trail. I passed through the archway again and honestly broke into a full-on sprint. I didn't see anything, but there was something there. I was being stalked. I could feel the eyes still even as I ran down the trail. I haven't been back to that trail since that day. I don't know what it was that was stalking me, but there was something there, and I don't want to find out what it was. I lived in South Central Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania State Game Commission continues to deny the existence of mountain lions in the state of Pennsylvania, despite many, many sightings over the years. I've seen two, both in the area near my parents' rural town. The first sighting occurred when I was a teenager. It was just about dusk, and I planned on walking home from my grandmother's to my parents' house. I got about a halfway through the large field that I would cross to get to the path to my parents' house. When I noticed something moving along the tree line. Initially, I thought it was one of the neighbor's dogs, but it wasn't moving like a dog. I stopped to watch as it dawned on me what I was really looking at. It was a dusky, dark, tan cat, bigger than any cat I had ever seen. I realized what it was, and slowly backed up across the field and back to my grandmother's, where I requested a ride home. The second was seen by multiple neighbors before we saw it out the window. This cat was much darker in color almost black, but similar in size, and certainly not a bobcat. We've also seen rather large tracks when hunting two separate mountains in the area. Unsure why the game commission persisted that they are extinct and a fragment of everyone's imagination. But mountain lions are definitely out there in the Appalachia still. A few years ago, I went camping with my dad, about a quarter mile off the trail. As we were cooking food, a bear baby wanders into our small clearing. We were a bit freaked out, but it was probably more scared of us, so it wandered away. We left the campsite to hike a bit, and when it started to get dark, we traveled back to our campsite. We realized we hadn't marked it in any way and spent a while looking for it. We heard some growling, really loud and freaked. We started to walk on the trail back to the car with my dad 
holding onto our only flashlight. We heard a growl closer this time. Not super close, but close enough that we started to run. By then, it was pitch black other than the flashlight. As I ran, I heard my dad drop the flashlight. He found it, but only one of the batteries was still in it. I was thinking this definitely felt like a basic horror plot. We ran pretty fast the few miles back to the car and drove home. We came back the next day and searched all day. Couldn't find it. We came back the next weekend. Still couldn't find it. And the next weekend, my dad went by himself and found it. He brought the stuff home. The tent had claw marks through it. And all the food that we hadn't yet hung in a tree was eaten. I have not been camping since. This takes place in October 1977, when my mum was 16. She ran away from her abusive home along with her friend Lisa. They hitched from Mass all the way to California. Obviously, this wasn't the brightest of plans, but given my mum's turbulent home life and past experiences, she didn't see how it could be much more dangerous than anything she'd already experienced. They had a pretty safe and uneventful trip across the country, finding friends in many truck drivers and other travelers. It wasn't until they reached California when this encounter happened. The Hillside Strangler at first was thought to be one assailant. It ended up being two men who were caught and brought to justice for 10 murders. So my mum and Lisa end up meeting these two guys who were super nice to them. They crashed at their place for a few days, partying, but nothing bad had come of it. These guys tell the girls that they're going to take them to the Hollywood Hills and Sunset Boulevard to see the sights. Not being from that area, my mum had no idea that these areas were more crime ridden at the time, especially considering they were supposed to be sightseeing. My mum really wanted to see where all the movie stars lived. These guys take my mum and her friend to some divey restaurant slash bar and get them super drunk. It's also the first time my mum is introduced and tries cocaine. After these underage girls are now completely high and drunk, they split off into pairs and my mum's friend disappears with one of the guys. My mum is now hanging out with just one of her new guy friends. He then suggests that they stand on the sidewalk of Sunset Boulevard in the middle of the night. And if slash when a car pulls up, she should get in and direct the driver to drive across the street to this dark parking lot. It isn't really up until the first and only car pulls up and she gets in that she's realized this guy is prostituting her out. Keep in mind, these guys had been nothing but kind and respectful to my young mum and her friends the past few days. Also, and very sadly, this type of abuse is not a new concept for her either. She gets into the car, and instead of pulling into the parking lot, he keeps driving straight. My mum explains that he's going the wrong way, so he starts driving faster. My mum moves towards the door, but he locks it, hits her, and attempts to hold her down at the same time. He tells her she isn't going anywhere. My mum knew in her head she needed to get out of the car or she'd be dead. So in one swift move, she unlocks the door, tucks and rolls out the car. His car comes screeching to a halt. She sees some bushes in front of a house, so she runs and hides behind them. He's turned around looking for her creeping along. His passenger side was facing where she was hiding and she was peeking through the bushes and she saw he had a gun. As soon as his car crept by, she ran to the backyard. It was all fenced in. There was no other way out, 
so she had to go back the way she'd came. By the time she crawled back into the bushes to see if he was still around, she saw his car had gone to the end of the road and turned back round. So he passes again. And when she thought he was far enough away, she crawled out the bushes to run. But then she sees his brake lights. Confident that he's now seen her, she runs as fast as possible around a corner. But she could hear his car, so she had to duck and hide behind parked cars on the road. As soon as he passes again, she books it across the street, which took her through the parking lot she was originally supposed to park in, and back to her friend. The creep did a circle again, but by this time she was with her friend, and they were leaving the area. My mum and her friend quickly ditched these two assholes and did find a safer place to stay. But only a short time later, did my mum call home and eventually made it home safely. It wasn't till a long time later that she saw on the news a story about women being murdered and recognised the murderer, dubbed the Hillside Strangler, as the man who had picked her up that night. A side note, my mum literally just dictated this story to me. I've heard it before, but in not so much detail. She told me it was Kenneth Bianchi who drove the car this night. My mum said there was no questioning it. It was his distinguishing features and definitely his moustache. We were out in a state park, tent camping, not far from civilization. There were three of us. After drinking a bit too much and some other partying, we hiked a bit up the mountain behind our camp. Stupid. It was pitch black with a very steep incline. About 30 minutes into the hike, in the middle of nowhere, we see a structure. It's a door and not much else. The door is built into a brick building. It had four walls, but the structure was so small and built just for the door. The front was about six feet wide, and then from the front to the back, it was probably two feet. I know it doesn't sound that creepy, but when you find a closed door on a tiny brick building thrown into the party, it becomes really creepy. Turns out the door was unlocked, so we opened it and there's no floor inside, but a ladder going down. You bet your ass none of us had the balls to go down. We dropped some rocks, and it took quite a while to hit the bottom. No splash, just a solid smack of rock against concrete. There wasn't much else we could do. Shit was really strange. I have no recollection of where it was, and I don't ever want to go back. My friends and I all wanted to visit an abandoned school because we thought it would be very creepy and fun. We drive and once we get there, we see a full blown bonfire and thought that they were kids like us looking for a creepy night out. We were wrong. Apparently it was a gang initiation going on. They stopped us, asked if we had any drugs, alcohol or money. The driver, my best friend, was frozen with fright, and they tried to pull him out of the driver's seat. I was sitting behind him, and trying to talk some sense into him to get the car to drive off. No dice. He sat there frozen. A huge gangster put his hand into the car and tried to unlock my door. I blocked his hand and he immediately started punching the window. Finally, my best friend kicked into gear and slammed the car into reverse and put the pedal to the metal. I was so relieved. For a few seconds, everything was in slow motion. He even hit the guy trying to get the door open. Then he hit a boulder behind us. The car jerked and came to a stop. And luckily the car didn't hit a ditch and we sped off. We were so lucky. The path to the abandoned school was on a mountain road, and we couldn't have easily fallen into a ditch when he was heading back. We laughed about it, 
Ut, my friend, had to replace his door and his trunk. I grew up in Philadelphia, with a wooded creek behind our roadblock. My brother and I were always forbidden to play anywhere near there, and not even think about going there. So as any good little child does, one boring summer day, we smelled smoke and heard noises, and decided we were the best detectives to snoop it out. After minutes of walking further into the thicker brush, we finally saw the source of smoke, as we saw two men walking away from a burning car fire. It wasn't until a few years later after dinner, overhearing the adults talk about that poor unidentified little girl's remains found in a burnt skeleton of a car years ago in the woods, my brother and I, then 12 and 14, looked at each other wide-eyed, jaws dropped, as we put two and two together, to realise what we had stumbled upon in the woods that day. And if we had been older or smarter, or unafraid of getting whooped by going down there in the first place, the murderers could have been caught. And even maybe, that little girl could have been saved. But looking back at it, I realised more than likely she was already deceased, before the fire, and that we're lucky to have made it out ourselves. In Idaho, there's this natural hot springs up on top of a mountain. It's at the end of a dirt road and up a trail. It's not very well known. A buddy and I decided to spend a few days camping up there, so we set up camp at the trailhead. While we're making dinner, we see a car pull up and four kids in their 20s get out, all dressed in swimwear. They walk past us and wave, then head up the trail. A few hours go by and it's probably 6pm, and starting to get dark in winter. So my buddy and I grab a bottle of scotch and head up the trail, fully expecting to join the other group in the hot springs. We get up there and there's no one in the hot springs. Sandals and towels all strewn about the area, but no people. We thought it was weird, but figured they all went into the woods to collectively pee or something. We spent two hours in the springs and never saw any signs of them. We went back to camp at 1am and their car was still there. We woke up in the morning and the car and clothes were gone. No idea what they were doing, though. This happened about five years ago. I am a 26-year-old man, making me 21 when this event occurred. I live in Southern Ohio, about 45 minutes away from Cincinnati. I went to a smaller college in the area and I was pretty isolated from most of my friends and family during the week. My friends all went to their various choices of college throughout the Midwest, and my family remained in my hometown. I ended up at a school alone, because I had a rather specific major, and this was one of the few colleges in the country that would accommodate me. Luckily, my girlfriend went to college fairly close to me, so I would often find myself making two to three trips a week to see and study with her. On most weekends, I would go on road trips to visit my friends, considering their campuses were a lot bigger and a lot more fun than my small town college. During this particular weekend in question, I was getting ready to make about a two-hour trip to see my friend Kyle at his school, the name of which I probably shouldn't disclose. I had made the same trip about 30 times before, so I knew the route pretty well at this point, and didn't even have to use a GPS to get there. I left on Friday afternoon once I was done with classes for the day 
and I was set to arrive at Kyle's dorm at around 8pm, right on time to go out for a night of binge drinking and eating garbage food. Oh, the joys of college. I set off at about 5.50, and was roughly 15 minutes into my trip, when my girlfriend called me. This was pretty unusual, considering I had already told her I was driving to Kyle's. So I answered quickly, thinking something must have been wrong. She was working that night, and her car had broken down in her dorm room parking lot when she was trying to leave to go to work for her shift. She figured I wasn't too far into my trip, and wanted to know if I could give her a quick ride to work before I got too far. Me being the dutiful boyfriend I was, agreed to come and get her, since I was only about 20 minutes away. I was already pretty far off campus, so I pulled over my car on the highway, and used GPS to see if there was a faster route to her from where I was. The bump on my phone revealed that there was an exit coming up, that would take me to a side street that I could use to get to her fairly quickly. So I text her, and let her know that I was on my way, and set towards my destination. I had seen the exit in question plenty of times, but I never had any reason to get off on it. So once I exited the highway, my surroundings were completely unfamiliar to me. The exit took me off onto a road that had dense wood on the right side, and the highway on the left. My phone informed me the next turn wasn't for about another five miles, so I had a ways to go until I had to do any navigating. About a half mile later, the road had turned, and there were now trees on either side of me, and to be honest, it was a really beautiful sight. It was October, so the surrounding woods were a mixture of various warm colours, and I actually was really enjoying my little detour. The entire area was wooded on either side, with only the occasional break in the tree line for a driveway and a mailbox to poke out. The houses were hard to see through the trees, but from the few glimpses I did manage to steal, the houses were actually pretty nice. It was getting a little dark, and I had about a mile to go before I had to turn, when I noticed a Toyota with the hood popped open further down the road. As I approached, I noticed a man in a shirt and tie with his head under the hood, seemingly with a broke down car. There was no traffic behind me. So I stopped for a moment and asked him if everything was okay, or if he needed to borrow my phone or anything. He didn't seem to hear me at first, so a little louder this time I said, Everything okay? This time he seemed to have heard me, and he lifted his head up away from the engine, and looked up at me. He seemed like a completely normal guy, and had a normal face to match. The best way I can describe him is pedestrian looking. He had short brown hair, brown eyes, and five o'clock shadow. He smiled at me and said he was on his way home from work, and that something had gone wrong with his engine. I offered him my phone in case he wanted to call anyone to get picked up, or get the car towed. He said, oh no, that's okay. I have a car service that will come and get my car for me. They're closed until tomorrow morning though, so I hate to ask, but could you possibly give me a ride to my brother's house? He only lives four minutes away from here. This absolutely should have been a red flag for me. I think I was just a little stunned by how normal this guy seemed, considering most hitchhikers on TV are crazy, or are axe murderers. Why couldn't he have just used my phone to call his brother? Why couldn't he have just called his own brother with his own phone? I guess I just wasn't thinking clearly at the time, but hindsight is 2020, and I'm well aware I made a bad decision that night. I was physically much bigger than him, and he was driving a nice car, so I figured he wasn't a weirdo or local crazy person, and that I could overpower him if need be. So 
so I agreed to give him a quick ride to his brother's house since it was on the way to my girlfriend's, who would later be livid with me for taking so long to get her to work. But that's a story for another time. I unlocked the door for him to get in, and he pointed me in the direction of his brother's house, and we set off on our way. Things were pretty normal for a few minutes, and I was starting to feel like maybe I had done the right thing. Then, things started to get weird. The first thing that made me uncomfortable was the way he acted every time there was a swear word in the music. He was almost flinching at every time 50 Cent said something of that nature. And I picked up on it pretty quickly. So I changed the song, thinking that he was just really against swearing or something. About a minute later, I changed the song, though there was no swearing in that one. He reached up, slammed his hand on the radio power button, and turned it off. It wasn't crazy hard or anything, but it was definitely enough to get me to notice. I tried to make light of the situation and said, Not your style? This question was met with complete silence. At this point, I was ready for the guy to get out of my car. So I asked, how much further do we have to go? I have somewhere to get to and I can't be late. He said we had about four minutes to go, which immediately sent up warning signals in my head, considering he had told me the same thing about eight minutes ago. I decided that was enough. I didn't think he was dangerous or anything, but I figured our destination was further than he was letting on, or that he was lying, so that I would take him despite the distance. It was getting late, and I wasn't trying to face my girlfriend's wrath. So I told him this was as far as I could go, and that he would have to walk the rest of the way. His mood changed immediately, but instead of getting angry, which I was expecting, he became panicky, and practically begged me to take him the rest of the way. His overreaction set off pretty much every alarm I had in my head. So I told him to remove himself from my car before I had to remove him myself. It was then, he pulled out his rather oversized wallet, and offered to pay me to take him the rest of the way. He tried to pull out a stack of $20 bills. As he removed them from his wallet, something else fell down onto the seat next to him. It was only a split second before he grabbed it and shoved it back into his pocket. But I got a good enough look at it for it to haunt me to this day. Along with his money, a small Ziploc bag of what I'm confident were full adult teeth fell out of his wallet. Front teeth, molars, you name it. Everyone I've told this story to has been skeptical of this part but I'm confident of what I saw. I freaked out worse than I ever have, and screamed at him to get out of my car, and he immediately did, and was looking at me with surprised eyes on the side of the road. I took off and called the police, who simply told me to not pick up hitchhikers ever again, and that they couldn't do anything about the man since he didn't commit any crimes. I don't know where he was going, or what he was doing, and I'm pretty sure I don't want to know. I do know, however, that he seemed to have all of his teeth still in his mouth. I don't know whose teeth those were or why he had them. A creepy teeth hitchhiker? Let's not meet again. It was a long weekend at the mountains. The weather was about 19 Celsius, and I was the only person that had camped before. I suggested everyone else not to pitch their tents on a very flat surface in case of rain. It hadn't rained in weeks, so it was pretty dry, so they paid no attention to my words. 2 or 3 a.m. came, and one of the biggest storms I had ever seen started pouring. The thunder and lightning was so constant, it faded out all the voices. Everyone got flooded and ended up moving into my 10 people tent, even though there were 16 of us in total. My girlfriend and I were the only dry ones. When the lightning stopped, 
we heard a huge crack, followed by a super loud scream. And then, complete silence. It was a female scream. Nobody wanted to exit the tent because it was pouring hard. The next day, only two out of the five tents were found. The water took the rest. Everybody's provisions were lost. The loud female scream was of a camping couple who were near our location, and a tree fell crushing part of their tent. They were okay, but so traumatized they didn't speak a single word. We thought we were the only ones camping in the area, so the scream caught us totally by surprise. Super. I was hunting in the middle of Missouri with my uncle and dad. We were about four miles from the truck and 30 miles from civilization. I was sitting at the campfire while my uncle and dad went to get more firewood. I had a gun sitting next to me. I was cooking some fish we caught in a nearby pond on the fire and was close to dozing off. I heard footsteps and looked up to see a guy in orange walking towards me with a smile on his face that looked off. He began about 25 yards from me, and I couldn't wake out why he was wearing all safety orange. I shouted at him and asked if he needed help. He began to walk faster, and that's when I saw his limp. His right pant leg was covered in blood, and the fabric was torn. He kept walking towards me, and I picked up my gun and pumped it. He kept right on going, and I pissed my pants. He was about 15 feet from me before I heard, shit. My uncle had just dropped a piece of wood in his foot and yelled. The guy immediately turned and ran into the woods. Turns out he escaped from prison earlier that day and was found dead in the woods, half eaten by animals a few days later. We left as soon as they got back. Nothing has made me not want to go back into the woods, but I've had some strange experiences and seen some disturbing stuff. I've walked into two marijuana groves and into one still sight. I backed away slowly from all three. The marijuana sites were strange because it took me a minute to realize what I was seeing. When you're picking your way through fairly thick vegetation, a plant is a plant until it isn't. I did have an unexplained sitting of a creature about seven years ago. I'm not sure what that was. I'm trained in animal identification by tracks, scat, and sight. It honestly looked a lot like the Bigfoot you hear about in stories. I actually was walking into a spot where I duck hunt. It had snowed several days before and had frozen slash thawed a few times. So there was a really thick crust on the snow. I'm a big guy and could easily walk on top without breaking through. As I walked along a farm path, I heard something in the forest to my right. Looking, I noticed a shape maybe 30 yards away, trying to hide behind a pine tree. I could see it clearly. It kept sliding to the left and peering out around the tree trunk. I stopped and it turned and ran away downhill, crossed the upper end of a frozen beaver pond, breaking through the ice and crossed an open field on the other side and disappeared into the woods. I lost sight of it before it broke through the ice and it scared me. Shaking, I drew my pistol and made my way back into the field on the far side of the beaver pond and looked at the muddy tracks where it came out of the water. They were just smudges. It wasn't even denting the packed frozen snow. I went down to the water to look at the broken ice. It was thick enough for me to stand on and I tried it. I went back to the tree that it was trying to hide behind. There was a limb that was across its face, so I knew I could get a height estimate. That limb was even with the top of my head, 
when I was standing where it would have stood. I'm six foot. So that thing would have at least been six foot six or more. What was it? It was bipedal. Stood at least six foot six. Maybe it was a person. What could possibly make a human cross a frozen pond in cold 10 degrees Fahrenheit weather, not knowing if the ice would support them, or even how deep the water was? Then, where did this now very wet person go into a 300 acre forest? There is still a logical explanation. I just don't know what it is. When I was eight, I went camping with my mom, stepdad, and my little brother. We were all in the same tent. I remember getting up in the middle of the night to go to pee. And when I was walking back to the tent from the tree line, I heard, Mike, Mike, do you want to go for a walk in the woods? It sounded exactly like my mom's voice whispering. And I could see the silhouette of whoever it was whispering. And it looked like my mum. But I knew it wasn't her because I'd just left the tent where she was sleeping. I remember my heart pounding like I knew it wasn't my mum and it was something sinister. But I responded and said, yeah, one minute, let me just grab my coat because I didn't want to upset her or it or whatever it was. Hurry up then, the voice responded. I got into the tent and woke everyone up in a crazy panic. My mum and stepdad told me I must have been sleepwalking, but I swear I remember it so vividly, and I don't sleepwalk and never have. At the time, I knew in my head it was real. I'm terrified of the woods now. This is actually true, and I try and tell my mum every time now and then that I actually saw and heard what I said, but she perpetually dismisses it. If I'm honest, I don't really believe in the supernatural, but I don't know what that was. This story happened to my girlfriend. Her and a few friends, two gals and a guy, went camping to a remote place in the woods for fun. It was like a little turnout near a random forest service road. The guy friend, who I will refer to as Manly Man, was actually a scaredy twip and hated sleeping in the woods, but for whatever reason loved being out there. In order to alleviate his fears, he brought a dose of sleeping aid, either Ambien or OTC Benadryl. I can't remember which. Fast forward to around dusk, they're enjoying a fire and generally jesting when a truck rolls up lifted, loud, you know the type. One guy gets out the passenger truck door and another stays in the cab. They want directions to somewhere that no one's ever heard of and want to use a phone since they have no service. After being told no one else has service, he proceeds to ask questions like, just you four up here? Did you know there were bears? There aren't any in Oregon Valley. Are you carrying protection from wild animals? Rather annoying and innocuous stuff, until... Fast forward again to the middle of the night, when Manly Man is thoroughly knocked the hell out, and headlights pop up in the road. An engine rolls closer. My girlfriend wakes up spooked, and the engine stops and the headlights cut. There's no noise for a few minutes, then rustling. My girlfriend wakes up. They all start freaking out and are trying to rouse the manly man. Eventually he wakes up, groggily agrees that this rustling is real and he's a bit nervous. They listen for a while longer and after the noise gets closer, they start shouting, who's there? And receive no reply and the rustling stops. Needless to say, they threw their camping stuff in the back of the truck and got the hell out. They passed the same truck a bit down the road with no one inside. Either those two pricks were playing a prank or legit up to some shitty shady things. But either way, 
not how you want to be woken up in the middle of nowhere. They ended up crashing at Manly Man's house in the living room and playing Risk the next day. One of my experiences happened on family land that we own in North Carolina, where I used to live. I still hunt, so it's never kept me from going again. We call it the noise. To this day, if you ask people who live or lived adjacent to the land about it, they know exactly what you're talking about. Whatever it is was very loud and very fast. It was like a very loud primal scream. The first time I heard it, I was hunting with my dad and brother. We were stork hunting and very, very slowly and methodically moving throughout the forest. I noticed everything had gotten oddly quiet. The only thing you heard was the water running over the rocks in the creek. My dad stopped us and said to hold still and not to move. As soon as we stopped, it screamed behind us. It was so loud it made my ears ring. My dad never showed fear and was always rational. He looked very nervous and I'm ready to shit on myself. My brother has his gun shouldered, looking around trying to spot it just to see what it is and make sure it isn't close. Then it screams again now. It seems closer and in front of us. My dad puts his hand on my shoulder and just says run for the car now. I jump up like a scared rabbit and run as fast as my legs will carry me. We're all running and we can hear this thing screaming as we run like it's keeping pace with us. I can see the gravel road ahead and know the car is close. It lets out another scream that sounds like it's on my left now and very close. I bolt right and we all come sliding out onto the road about a hundred yards above the car. That's when I hear this weird whistle from the woods and then everything just goes back to normal. Birds chirping away squirrels calling, crows cawing, and we stopped to catch our breath and easily walked to the car ready for anything. A hundred yards never seemed so far away. That wasn't the last time we heard it. In fact, it happened many other times. My family tried to find it for many years to figure out what it was. We even trained hunting dogs, but they ran away from this weird stuff. But I still love to hunt and figure that if something gets me while I'm hunting, at least I'm doing something I love and being close to nature. I've been camping once and never will again. So a few friends and I planned a trip to take our Enos to a camping ground and stay there the night. We got there set up, made some s'mores and whatnot, and went to bed. Being the dumb high schoolers that we were, we did not check the weather, and it began to thunderstorm very badly about an hour into sleeping. We all rushed into my car, all six of us, and sat there for about an hour. After the storm passed, we got out and began trying to set up again. I hadn't taken more than two steps out the car when we heard a loud crash off in the distance. My first instinct was to get back to the car, but we came to the consensus that we should investigate. So we took some flashlights and walked down the road, about 500 yards to find that a huge tree had crashed on a couple's airstream. They were outside of it with their dogs, and the woman was shaking because she said the trunk landed about two feet from her head. We ended up calling the very reluctant park ranger who came to take a look. He let us out of the campground and we just drove back to one of our friend's houses for the night. It's really scary. I'm not sure what would have happened if we went down the road and had found the lady's head smashed in by that tree trunk. When I was 17, 
I worked at an indoor pool as a lifeguard. I had two very strange encounters while working at that establishment. But the one I am about to share certainly takes the cake. First, a little foreshadowing, as the details are important. I was dating a boy at the time who was chill as hell, and he had an absolutely crazy older brother. The way we met was mad. I was hanging out in said boyfriend's room, watching him play Kingdom Hearts, and one of his cousins bursts into the room and asks me to come to the bathroom immediately. A look of shock clearly plastered on his face. I got up and joined him outside the small bathroom. The thing that sticks with me the most was that I saw blood everywhere, and I mean everywhere. You're a lifeguard, right? The man bleeding over the sink asked me. Uh, yeah, I replied sheepishly. So you know first aid then? Of course. I don't know why, but then I kicked into training mode and began cleaning his bloodied hands to find the source of the flow. We'd sat in silence mostly. I was afraid to ask many questions. He was obviously inebriated anyway. I cleaned and bandaged him up to the best of my ability. Later I found out from my boyfriend that his brother had been drinking that night along with doing some other drugs. Apparently he got pissed off and went into full rage mode and destroyed his apartment with his bare hands. Crazy I know. Well one day, a pretty long time after, he saw me outside while I was over one night and approached me. I was in my car adding water and he then proceeded to tell me he really appreciated what I did for him that night and he had to repay me somehow. He went to my driver's side and tucked something in between the door and seat and said have a good night and that was that. I was busy with my car issues and forgot about the encounter. I honestly thought it was just some good bud, but I was wrong. It was a meat cleaver. Back to the pool now. It was late fall or early winter, therefore the pools were never too crowded this time of year, and you get to know the regulars. I was befriended by a boy maybe a few years older than me, called Jack. We had a lot in common, and despite him looking like a creep, we got on well enough. He never gave me any reason to fear him. We mostly talked about music, and he commented on how mature I was for my age compared to other girls. Again, this never alarmed me, because I heard this a lot from people. Ten years on, I still do. One day it was freezing and pouring down with rain. My shift was ending soon, and Jack had mentioned he had to walk home as his ride bailed on him. I said, the hell you are, you live close, I can give you a lift. He agreed to wait for my shift to end and hitch a ride. He told me where he lived, and I was familiar with the community. I got changed into my clothes. I wore silly goth clothes from Hot Topic. The pants were parachute and clasped, with a snap button and zipper. We left, and I headed to the community he said he lives in. As we approached, I put my blinker on, and he said, no, keep going. Boom, red flag. The only thing ahead past this development were fields and the occasional farmhouse. I spoke up and said, dude, you said you live here. He responded that it was only a little past here and that he used it as a landmark. Okay, fine. We kept going about three minutes, and after he said, this is me on the left. I was somewhat relieved to see it was a cluster of wealthy looking houses, maybe three acres apart. Better than the center of nowhere, I suppose. We pulled into the driveway, and I noticed there were no cars, which I guess makes sense since he did say his ride bailed. I put the car in park, and he pulled my parking brake up. What the? I tried to say, but I couldn't because the creep grabbed my hair and forced a kiss on me. 
I forgot to mention this fool had a grill so yellow. He made Big Bird look white. Anywho, I was trying to bite him, pull away and slap him, but he was much stronger than me. He forced his hand to the opening of my pants and the snap betrayed me. And I was reaching to my left at this point, remembering Big Brother's gift. I screamed and told him to get off me and whipped that sucker out so fast and slammed it into my steering wheel. It sliced into it all the way to the metal. The look on his face was priceless. He started to mumble and panic, not making much sense. And then he reached for my hand. So I pulled the cleaver out and went blindly swung it. I had no other option. I nicked the part of his hand where the thumb joins and he yelped out in pain. Get the hell out, I screamed, the words trembling and barely able to escape me. He hesitated, but starting to get out and started cussing me, calling me all kinds of colorful words. I was shaking like a leaf at this point and holding back tears. He slammed my door. I put the car in reverse and tore out the driveway. Then wham, I hit something. Hard enough to stop my car. Shit, I destroyed the mailbox. In my terror, I misjudged the driveway. He came running at me, hands up and screaming at me like, what the hell? My window was down and I heard him say, you're gonna pay for that. I screamed, shove it up your butt. There was something equally colorful and got the hell out of there. I drove straight to my boyfriend's, visibly shaken and crying at this point, and told him everything. We agreed my assault with the cleaver would cancel out police involvement, so he said he was calling his brother. I only saw Jack once more at a gas station late at night, and he just glared at me. I was with friends and begged them to leave. Haven't seen him since. So Jack, let's not meet again. This happened in the woods and changed my view of the world as a teenager. Up the street from my childhood house was a couple trailers. I had a four wheeler and would ride up the trails all day. One day I'm riding and I get this random horrible feeling. So I stop and get off at the ATV and start walking up the trail. Well, some arse hat puts a piece of fishing line across the trail that would easily take my head off. I'm guessing that the feeling I had in the pit of my chest was that I was being watched or that I subconsciously noticed the fishing line. I have no idea why I stopped that day and it baffled me ever since, but it has honestly changed my life. When I was 17 or so, two friends and I decided to camp in the field next to my housing estate so that we could drink beer and listen to music as loudly as we wanted to. This was a huge grassy field on a slight hill where all the surrounding houses were far away enough so that they wouldn't disturb the neighbors and we couldn't be seen by anyone unless they were extremely close to our tent. It became late and my two friends had fallen asleep. I was having trouble sleeping around that time, so I would lay awake for hours just thinking. It was around 3 a.m. when I heard the distinct sound of grass and vegetation and someone walking around outside our tent. I was stunned with terror there, but more so because I hadn't heard anyone approaching. Just suddenly, there was someone outside the tent. I held my breath out of fear and shock, which is when I heard another set of footsteps belonging to the dog by the sound of it. Filled with dread, I just lay there as still as possible, breathing slowly and quietly, listening to this person and his dog walking outside back and forth on the tent. I thought we were going to get shot or beaten by this dude. Then I saw this guy's shadow which freaked me out a hell of a lot more than I already was. It was huge and looming over us 
and every time he passed our tent, I couldn't see the dog's shadow, even though I heard it making increasingly erratic situations of the tent. This carried on for another five minutes, although it felt like much more time had passed. The shadows disappeared, and the sounds faded away. They didn't leave or anything. It was more like they were still walking outside of the tent, but with perpetually lighter footing, and there was no threat for me to come outside. I freaked out at my friends, and said we had to go, because someone knew we were here and they didn't believe me, thinking I had been asleep as well, and said that I had dreamt the whole thing. I assured them I haven't, and that we had to leave right now. They tried to get back to sleep, ignoring me, because they're lazy as hell, and didn't want to pack anything else up. So I gave up, even though I know that I'd never be able to sleep. Ten minutes later, the sound returned just like the volume outside had been turned up gradually. It felt like the same dread I had before, and whispered one of my friend's names so that they could actually hear, and shh, one lady said. They had already heard and told me to open the tent to see who was terrorizing us. I did so, slowly easing my hand out of the sleeping bag and up to the zipper. It probably took five minutes for me to reach it. It was so, so high, and I didn't want to make the sound. So I pulled it out so violently, I nearly ripped the bag in half. There was nobody there, and we got about a meter within the place of five seconds. And also, there was nobody nowhere. As I mentioned, we kept atop a hill in the middle of a field, and so could be seen by anyone who had decided to run. But there was nothing. Even though it was impossible for anyone to escape me seeing them, I'm absolutely positive there were no footsteps outside our tent that night. While my brother and I were camping at this primitive campsite in West Texas, it was about 12.30 at night, and we start hearing this very faint opera music in the forest around us. After heating up SpaghettiOs on our fire, which the park ranger specifically told us not to make, we'd noped the hell out of there and hiked the six miles back by moonlight to our truck and drove home. It was like it was following us, because we heard it all the way about a mile away from the parking lot. The reason it was creepy was because when we got to our campsite, after getting lost and escorted by the same park ranger from earlier in the story, he told us we were lucky to be the only people for miles around because of how peaceful it was. He said there was no one else there. My parents lived out in the country for a time, so as a kid growing up, it was really easy to get paranoid at night. All those wide open spaces and dark woods can seem ominous, but eventually you just get sort of used to it and tune it out. My sister and I would sometimes fall asleep in the living room, watching a late night TV program. Sometimes I would wake up to the sounds of footsteps on our deck in the dead of night, when no one would have been outside. My sister would sometimes see a shadowy figure for a brief moment, which always seemed to draw nearer when she could see it again. Eventually, whatever it must have been entered the house, because one day I closed every door in the entire house, as it was a very large single-story ranch house to keep our dog from getting into certain areas. When I came home, every single door on the inside of the house was wide open, along with the door I exited when locking up. I was worried there was a home intruder, but nothing else was missing. When I was 10, I was at a lake way out in the woods on some land my dad owned. I was alone aside from my dog, an Airedale Terrier. 
I'd been fishing on the little pier in the southeastern corner for about 10 minutes, when I noticed something or someone watching me from the tree line on the other side of the lake. I was only about 10, but I kept my composure. For some reason, I felt it important that whatever slash whomever it was did not know that I was aware. Anyway, it started moving slowly from tree to tree, never taking its eye off me. The lake was about 75 yards wide, so I couldn't see any details, but I could tell which way the figure was facing. I realized that it was stalking me, and I nonchalantly put my pole down and walked down to the pier and up the bank towards the trail back to our cabin. Once I hit the tree line, I hauled ass to the cabin and waited there with one of my dad's guns until my parents got home. The only witness I had was my dog, and he saw it as well. I know because he was staring intently at the figure while giving a low growl until I quietly told him to stop. I have no idea who or what it could have been, but I now know its intentions were most definitely not good. In the early 90s, we didn't live there, as our home was in Mobile, Alabama, but we spent most weekends up there. I know it could have been a person, but the nearest neighbor was a very old couple that lived a few miles away. The closest paved road was a good 15 to 20 minute drive away from our land. Aside from the lake and the open area our cabin was on, the surrounding area was a really thick forest. The figure was extremely tall as well. I have an extremely good memory, especially for details. Also, shortly before I actually noticed it, I got a very strong, I'm going to be watched by something dangerous feeling. I've never felt safe there again, and I was glad when my dad sold it and got a place near Gulf Shores. I live in northeastern Oklahoma, and I consider myself a camping slash fishing enthusiast. One spring night, me and two friends decided to go fishing. It's around midnight. We're going to a place that was once a maintained primitive camping area. This is not a remote location, but it's not very well known either. As we approach the turn off for our spot, we see another vehicle slowly turning out of it and proceeding in the way in which we came. We pass them and a friend says how he figured no one else would be around. We get to our spot, get our gear out and begin to prepare. But as we chat, drink a few beers, we all notice an unspoken uneasiness. Something is just not right. Usually I'm a trooper, fishing until the sun comes up, but I'm the first to crack. I explain to my friends how I feel, and that we should leave, and that I have a bad feeling. They agree, we load up, and while slowly driving through the old campground, we notice some brightly glowing embers in an area that no one has been. My friend who's driving stops without even thinking and goes for a look. He's startled, telling us to come see. What we saw were the remains of three crosses made of wood that would stand about 12 inches if upright. They had been burned along with the small campfire. And to make it even better, we were all lying on freshly turned soil, which resembled a freshly dug grave. We freaked, got the hell out of there fast. Thank you, sweet baby Jesus, that we are home free, was all I thought. When we approached the exit of the old campground, we noticed a vehicle parked on the side of the road. We passed it, and realized it was the same car we passed on the way in. There was no one in the car. They had doubled back, and were likely watching us, waiting to do who knows what. This experience was legit one of the most terrifying things that's happened to me while walking my dog, and he's done some weird stuff. 
So back in 2015, I had a choice of getting a dog or getting a smartphone. I'd never had a dog in my life or a decent smartphone come to think of it. And I'd been saving up for a phone anyhow. So naturally I picked the dog. My dad knew a fellow who had a couple of border collies that recently had a litter. So we drove out, the dude gave me the last pup and enter Bailey. A couple of weeks later, he got his shots and I started walking him. My parents figured I was going to be hanging out at the local park with my new pup so I could get him socialized, but no. I chose to take him around the perimeter of a nearby farm to keep the farm dog in him. I'd been sneaking out to this farm for years. The farmer was an old family friend and my uncle had grown up working with him. So I knew if I were ever caught, I would just drop their name. On either side of the farm, there was some thick woodland, which no one had ever given me reason to be wary of they probably should have. So it's a sunny afternoon. It had been pouring down all week and Bailey was itching for a good walk. I take him to the farm at our usual time and we start making our way around the woods on the east side of the farm. Everything is quiet, but Bailey keeps darting away for me to explore. He's a puppy. It's what they do. But of course, I'd been calling his name all the way around the field. We're about halfway past the woods and I could see the roof of the farmhouse over the next hill. Bailey's been pulling crap out of the bushes all the way along and I just gave him into trouble for rolling in a pile of fox crap. That's when I heard a man's voice calling my dog's name. Like this dude I didn't even know was calling my dog by name. I knew it wasn't the farmer because I'd met him at family events like barbecues and weddings. So I knew what he sounded like. I go completely silent, but the guy keeps calling my dog. It sounds like he's deep into the woods and maybe moving, but he's calling my dog with such an excited tone in his voice. And that is what creeps me out the most. Bailey, meanwhile, is completely ignoring this guy and sniffing a now flat pile of poop. I'm a tiny 18 year old girl. The most combat experience I have is a month learning Taekwondo when I was 11 and I don't have a mobile phone. If that guy works out where I am, I'm screwed. And if Bailey decides to go after him, I'm double screwed because I'm not letting this possible psycho get his hands on my puppy. I can either run to the farm, which isn't too far away, or run back through the fields towards home. I pick up my dog and sprint across the fields. Behind me, I hear someone emerge from the woods, but I'm already over the fence and sprinting back home with my puppy tucked under my arm. I get home and tell my mum, she brushes it off as some weird drunk guy. A few weeks later, I'm at my uncle's house and the farmer walks in. I had told my uncle what happened, so he brings it up. The farmer asks exactly which woods I'd been close to and that some of his clothes had gone missing from his washing line. He put it down to strong winds, but now he's not sure. I take him and my uncle to the exact spot the next day and all three of us go in and find a completely wrecked campsite. There's no clothes or anything, but the tent had collapsed in on itself. There's no fire, but there are some empty gas canisters, like the ones you'd use for portable stoves and empty packets of food scattered everywhere. We reported it to the police, but nothing really came of it, except that I got a phone not long after and kept it on me whenever I went out. This happened about six years ago. It's a story I've told many times and will continue to tell because honestly, it was probably the closest I've ever been to getting killed. 
or if not killed, then something else really horrible. The summer of 2012, me and my best friends were hitchhiking around Eastern Europe with no money, like a bunch of crusty punk bums. We were 19 at the time and really bought into that lifestyle, but we're over it now. Without boring you with unnecessary details, we were making our way towards Poland from the Baltics and happened to hitch a lift into Lithuania at the Latvian border. The dude who picked us up was really friendly, but he was ultimately going in a different direction. And so he dropped us off at this spot that he told us was really good for hitching. He dropped us off and it was a large concrete area by the side of a road in the middle of the Lithuanian countryside, probably designed for truckers to pull in and take a nap or whatever. On one side of the road was endless cornfields. The other side was some woods. It was pretty late in the evening and there was no traffic anywhere. So we decided to call it a night, cross the road towards the edge of the woods and got out our sleeping bags, food, etc. by this small dirt mound near the road by the woods. As we were unwinding, we heard a woman screaming from across the road. We immediately ran to see what was going on, and we could just about make out two men running away in the cornfields. We stood there in shock, and a few moments later, a car up the road pulled out of the cornfields and sped off into the distance. We stood there in shock wondering what to do. Then a few moments later, a police car showed up. He asked us questions in Lithuanian, and we explained to him in English that we were just hitchhikers. He said this to us. This is a very dangerous place. You shouldn't be here. Then proceeded to roll up his windows and drive back the way he came. We were pretty spooked at this point. So we crossed the road to our bags by the dirt mound on the edge of the woods. My friend had a crappy little rusty penknife, and we agreed to stay vigilant. It was nighttime by this point, and after a while nothing happened. We were still a bit scared, and couldn't really sleep. Then, in the dead of night, in the woods next to us, we could hear footsteps, cracking the twigs and branches of the woods. They slowly got closer and closer to us, and they eventually stopped. We heard incessant whispering for a few moments, then heard the footsteps and twigs snapping and moving slowly away from us. Neither of us needed to say anything to each other. We both knew what had happened. At this point, we were petrified, and my friend took out his crappy penknife, and we just lay there bricking it, waiting. I remember saying to him, see you in hell, Connor, and him saying it back to me. An hour or two passed, and we were still laying there taking turns with the knife, in case we got attacked from different angles, not knowing what was going to happen. After a while, nothing happened, and the exhaustion kicked in and we passed out. Suddenly, we were abruptly woken up early in the morning as it was sunny by the stage, by the sound of a car really aggressively pulling up on the road. By the mound we were sleeping behind. We heard car doors slam and footsteps stomping towards us really quickly. As we were lying down and behind the mound, we couldn't really see them, but we could feel that they were inches away from us. I'll never forget the fear that I felt at that moment. My whole body froze and I simply thought, this is it. They stopped, and we heard a really angry argument in Lithuanian between two men. It stopped after what felt like an eternity, but in reality, was probably no more than 30 to 60 seconds. They stomped back to the car and drove off. I almost vomited with relief. We immediately got up, packed our bags and began walking as far away as possible from that area and started hitchhiking. We're not sure what we were privy to that night. We don't think it was sexual assault or else there would have been more screams. 
Could it have been murder? The perpetrators were watching us from the woods, whispering. They were seconds away from either killing us or taking us the next morning. This happened six years ago, and it's still so surreal thinking that this happened and that we got away unscathed. For all we know, we could be a pile of bones somewhere in an unknown Lithuanian forest. I'd also like to add as well, before any of this happened, there was a weird precursor. We were on the Latvian-Lithuanian border in a small village sitting on a wall. We walked past a police car, with what looked like two very heavily asleep police officers, almost dead even, and some random guy shouting at them through the window. We thought it was strange and sat down on the wall. We watched the event from a distance before proceeding to roll some cigarettes. We both looked up again and about 20 seconds later, they had all just vanished. There was no sight of them anywhere and it was a long stretch of road both ways. We both thought it was weird as hell. We hitched a lift from that wall and it was a talking point right up until our calamity a few hours later. It kind of set off the tone for the night. I know it's an irrelevant detail overall, but I feel I should mention it anyway, because even though we weren't spooked, we were weirded out until shit got real. I was out camping on a shoreline in Alaska for field work. It was getting dark and I started falling asleep with my bear spray next to me. In the middle of the night, I hear a deep, angry grunting sound. I immediately grab my bear spray and started yelling, Hey, bear. The noise doesn't stop for a solid two minutes, and I'm literally thinking it's the end. But then I hear a large splash. I never want to hear another sea lion growl in the middle of the night again. I was working on a construction site, on a greenfield site in the UK, next to an elevated section of the M6 motorway in northwest England. Because of the proximity to the motorway during the main groundwork phase, we had to work at night, between midnight and 4am, as the motorway had to be closed for periods during work because there had to be vibration monitoring in place on the motorways. I was project manager, so was working night shift along with the construction crews, so I was mostly just milling around rather than working, and the job was small, so there was only around five of us on site, including me. It was winter, so it was a pretty miserable environment. One of the construction workers sent for a cigarette, and they came back, pretty quickly as white as a sheet, and they'd said that they'd heard a woman crying in her pyjamas in the woods. We all just laughed it off, but then someone else mentioned they'd thought they'd seen it, when standing in a farmer's field near the site, while he was driving to the site but didn't mention it, that it happened, and thought he was mistaken. So by this point, we're all starting to get pretty spooked, we turn on the main compound lights. We only had the immediate area lit up and had tan torches as we had restrictions on the amount of light that we could have during the next night working. And when we turned on the lights, we saw about five women wearing gowns and pajamas of various ages at the end of the light, not far from our side. And then they bolted into the woods that basically freaked out the group. A few of us went back to the main access track and followed it along the direction they had run off in, but we came across a spooky looking one lane wide tunnel and were basically like, screw going in there. The road was just a private access track and had no street lighting or anything, so it was pretty scary. So we packed up the cars and left the site straight away to return in the morning. After a bit of investigation the following day, 
we found out a little further along the road from the turn-off, from the site, that it was a transitional rehabilitation unit for women. Basically, a private specialist residential hospital for people recovering from physical and psychological brain trauma. Things like acute brain trauma caused by car clashes to serious cases of PTSD and schizophrenia. Acute bipolar 2 and other neurological issues too, as they had friends who worked in the hospital and wondered at night what would make them select them. I was winter camping in northern Wisconsin with a few buddies when at around 11pm, a guy appears in the firelight out of nowhere with no flashlight or headlamp. Now this place is not a campground, nor a national forest, or any land designated for camping, just wilderness. The nearest town is approximately 12 miles away, and the roads aren't ploughed, so they're nearly impassable this time of year unless you have the right equipment. This guy sits down, has a couple of beers, is friendly, and leaves after about 45 minutes and disappears back into the forest. We have been camping and exploring this area for about a decade, and from the direction he came from, there is only forest that empties into vast swamps. I don't know how or where he was going or surviving that night, because it was midnight, and we never saw or heard a truck leave on the only road in and out of this area. There are no cabins back here, no camps, nothing. It was February in northern Wisconsin, and the low that night was around 5 degrees Fahrenheit. My mum's family used to live in the countryside in the northern region of Colombia. It was the late 70s or early 80s. I don't know exactly when. My grandpa had his own farm. He wasn't a big landowner though, but he owned a small farm in the middle of the Serrania. He has worked since he was 11 years old because my great grandfather died when he was just a kid. During all his teenage years, he learned everything related to farming, how to tame horses, herd cattle, grow plants and whatnot and he was indeed very knowledgeable on agriculture, since they lived amidst the dense jungle. It was normal to hear witches laughing or whistling, and hearing the screams of La Llorona. Not only that, it was a tight-knit community. Everyone knew each other, and knew each other's business. My grandpa used to work for the big landowners of the region, however there was one, he always refused to work with. It was an extremely wealthy landowner. He had a number of heads of cattle, horses, and it was said that he also had thousands of hectares of land, where he cultivated rice, potatoes, yams and cassava. There was a rumour going around that this guy got all his possessions overnight by making a deal with the devil. Locals wouldn't work for him. Most people who did were unsuspecting foreigners who ignored the whole story. They were seduced by the high wages they were offered compared to those that they would have made if they'd have worked anywhere else. Most of the foreigners learned quickly about the boss's wrongdoings. But if we take into account that Colombia back then was even more of a shithole than it is today, what other option did they have? It was that, or perish from starvation. Everyone was aware that one of the clauses of the deal was that the landowner had to sacrifice the life of one of his employees and give his soul to the devil. Every single year, at around the same time, August. They would find one of his workers dead near the river, every year. And as you might think, this couldn't last forever. 
and the landowner's luck came to an end when all his employees started to quit. They moved to the main cities, found other jobs with other landowners, and this in part was also triggered by the guerrillas and gangs forcing people from their homes. The landowner suddenly found himself completely alone. He couldn't find anyone to take care of his crops or cattle, so he started to sell everything but his mansion. And then August came. My grandpa and uncles told me that it was a horribly gloomy day, and that that night, a huge storm, the likes of which they had never seen before, broke into their area. They heard deafening thunders and dreadful screams of agony that made their houses rattle and saw horrendous lightning illuminating the pitch black skyline. Everything ceased at 3am, so they could barely catch up on sleep that night. Once the sun rose in the morning, everyone started their usual day. But that same day, they were told that the landowner had been murdered. The whole town then rushed to his mansion and what they found was so gruesome and spine chilling, that up to this day, it sends shivers down their spine. The landowner was strapped to an oak tree, beheaded, and his entire body seemed to have been split in half with a saw. People who talked to him during his last days said that he was going crazy, and he often talked about a fight with the devil. Therefore, everyone thinks, that the landowner challenged the devil to a duel to the death, and he literally got smashed to pieces. I live on a small five acre hobby farm, nestled amongst a bunch of other five ish acre farms and homesteads. Not the suburbs, but not exactly deep woods either. Last year, some asshole in a pickup truck pulled over on the road besides my house and started shooting into the forested area of my property. I was just sitting at the kitchen table when I heard a huge gunshot. I thought it might have been a backfire, but then it happened again. I ran outside and could just see the guy through our hedge. He had a very big rifle and was pointing at it shooting at my goats. One of my goats is slim and brown and looks a bit like a deer. But dude, there are houses and people all over the place. Part of me wanted to march over and rip him a new one. But the other part of me told me I didn't want to become tragic headlines. So I just snuck closer to get a better look. But he got back into his truck and drove away. Turns out, one of my neighbors was outside at the time. He ducked behind a tree to avoid being shot. We called the cops, but we never managed to get his license plate number. I'm an American born woman, but my mother was born in South Africa, having emigrated in the 90s. Growing up, she always taught me to be on guard and to be extremely cautious. It was simple things, like driving up to an ATM at night. While my mom was using the machine, I had to look out of one window while my sister would look out of the other, so that we could see if someone was coming. I had always wanted to visit South Africa, and when I was 17, I went as a graduation present. I always ended up staying with my grandparents who were both in their late 70s. My grandmother was a hell bent on showing me as much of the country as possible, even though my grandfather had Alzheimer's and was worsening and traveling was becoming harder. Regardless, we took off from Johannesburg towards Cape Town. We would drive for up to six hours at a time. Anyone who has been to South America knows that you can go hundreds of miles and see nothing but grass, but it was incredibly beautiful and eerie. Once we drove into wine country in the Cape, we began passing signs that said don't pull over for people selling grapes. 
as we were near vineyards and people would steal grapes and then sell them on the side of the road. About hours three and four of the day, my grandfather was getting antsy. He was obsessing with the GPS in the car, plugging it in and re-plugging it in, cursing and getting furiated. Eventually, the thing just kept repeating, recalculating for hours on end. My patience was wearing thin, and I was trying to take it from him so that I could fix it, but he wouldn't let me touch it. Finally, my grandmother had enough and pulled over so that he could give it to me. The stretched out road was narrow and lined by trees. It was probably mid-afternoon, but we were the only car in sight and it was silent. My grandparents were reading the GPS instructions and arguing when my grandmother turns around. Keep watching out of the back window. I kind of smiled to myself, remembering that's what my mum used to do. I glanced at my phone, which had no service, and scrolled through my camera roll for the 300th time that day. I casually looked up and turned towards the back window, and my heart stopped. A man had come out of the trees and was running, at full sprint to our car. I found my voice and yelled, Go! to my grandmother and her instincts kicked in and we drove off. We drove away, and the man was just left standing there. My grandmother explained that often, when travellers pulled over for grape sellers, there would be people waiting in the trees who would come out and rob you, sometimes violently. It doesn't get much more vulnerable than a teenage girl and an elderly couple one of which was suffering from Alzheimer's. Thank you, Vam, for making me cautious. And I think I'm going to stay away from the forests from now on. My property is pretty old. We brought it from an old couple who gave up on it after a tornado destroyed the silos, barns and a couple of sheds. We spent years fixing it back up, but only one of the barns got rebuilt. The other is still collapsed. The shed is worn down and the door is blown out, which makes it always scary walking by a dark shed with an empty opening. This silo fell over and is next to the shed, which is across from the two barns. All of this was on my walk to a deer stand in the furthest field in the back of my property. I was a freshman in college at the time and hunted until it was dark. I left the stand and started quietly walking back. I always had an eerie feeling walking by the torn down barns, but at night, it's always way worse. I forgot to mention there's an old well with a concrete slab on the top of it but the concrete siding had a hole. It always gave me the chills. As I'm walking by the wells and barns, everything is super quiet. I all of a sudden jolted my eyes to the fence along the field by the shed. I heard a chain whipping sound and faint giddy laughter. When I looked up, I saw two men in prison gang garments, white and black striped suits, quickly galloping away from me, alongside the fence. Both were laughing, and had chains on their hands and feet. I quickly fell to the ground and loaded my rifle in terror. I looked through my scope where I saw them running alongside at last. It was the biggest field on our property, so they had another hundred yards to go alongside the fence before they hit the woods, but they were gone. I laid there searching for 10 minutes before chalking it up to being sleep deprived from the morning hunt. I never had experienced something so real, or did I imagine it? <laughs>